Well, hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Elder Scrolls Spotlight, a podcast about roleplay and roleplaying inside the Elder Scrolls online MMORPG. My name is Mikey, and I'll be your friendly neighborhood commentator for the evening. Boy, howdy. As the youngins would say, it has been a minute. But the last episode being back in December of 2018, we are recording this in February, just one day after my birthday. That is a long time, and I apologize. You see, I caught a cold in January, and when I get sick, I get sick as a dog. That all being said, let's just move on. One of the things I like about this podcast is the exploration of character morality. The characters you pretend to be often have unique lenses as to how they see the world. And with the exception of hmm, two people, I can't seem to recall any other people that identify their characters as quote-unquote evil. So I set out to see if there was anyone that actively role-played in that side of the morality spectrum. Eventually I did. She and I got to talking, and she graciously agreed to come on the show tonight. Tonight I hope to have a conversation with her about her characters, what may make them quote-unquote evil, what evil may mean for her, and hopefully close out the conversation about her work with her guild and event hosting. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have Sabriel7 joining us. Welcome to the show, God help you. Oh, shit. <laughs> We're off to a great start here. <laughs> this is great, this is great. We can finish this together, guys! <laughs> if it wasn't fumbling the, through the introduction, it was when the guest speaks too soon. <laughs> hey, you make a mistake, I'll make a mistake. We'll just get through this, like, just, you know, we'll do this quite fun. <laughs> Excuse me. But yes, welcome to the show. God help you. <coughs> How you doing? I'm doing quite fine. It sounds like it. If I'm not coughing, you're stumbling through it all, and this is going to be a great episode, I can tell. Yeah, it's going to be a terrific episode, everyone. <laughs> Let's just jump into it. Where are you from? How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, 25 years old, and I am actually from Red Deer, Alberta, Canada, so central Alberta. We're actually going to be, um, I'm in the city, it's going to be hosting the uh, Winter Games for Canada, coming up in about next week, actually, so my life at work is going to be pretty difficult. What is it that you do, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, actually, I work at a restaurant. Um, I'm actually all over the place in the uh, kitchen currently. Um, I used to be a server, but I can't do that now because I have zero patience for people anymore. So I am actually just uh, working in the kitchen currently. Okay, okay. Well, good luck to you when that happens. I'm sure you're going to have a great time. Hopefully, Mr. Was that famous chef? That's always that's always bad mouthing people. What's his name? Ramsey. Yeah, Gordon, Ram Gordon Ramsay. Hopefully Gordon Ramsay won't, won't jump in and be like, Hoy, what you doing is absolute shit. I highly doubt he'd go to a restaurant in Alberta still. I mean, who knows? I mean, if anything happened. Moving right along, then let's get into a subject that I think everyone can relate to. How'd you get into video games? Uh, I've actually been playing video games for pretty much all of my life. Like, as soon as I could figure out how to hold a controller I was playing, like my first games were, you know, the typical child games mario and things like that and then i upgraded to legend of zelda and i started playing um you know other games like um you know diablo starcraft all of those um, i used to live in a house in the middle of nowhere in the country so i didn't actually have internet for quite a while it wasn't until probably a year before uh elder Scrolls online actually uh uh, launch that I actually moved into town where i actually had internet and that's when i actually started playing mmos well, I started playing uh, Guild Wars 2. It was the first game I played. Uh, it was a, Yeah, it was actually where I actually got my handle from, uh, Sabriel 7, which I kind of uh, used for all MMOs. Because um, in Guild Wars 2, I don't know, I guess my uh, username thing started glitching out, because no matter what name I picked, it just told me it kept failing. So I gr literally grabbed the first book that was next to me and threw that name with the 7 at the end. I was actually reading the Sabriel series, and uh, that's kind of how my handle came to be and when i transferred from guild wars 2 to wow a few of my friends came with me and for them to actually recognize my name i still transferred the name over and that's kind of been my um exclusive uh, handle for all online games i guess okay let's scroll it back a little bit do you remember what your first video game was oh man that was probably when i was like five uh actually uh nintendo donkey Kong. Do you mean like the Donkey Kong, like the Jumpman, or Donkey Kong Country? Uh, Donkey Kong Country. Right. 
right? And like you can ride the rhinos and shit, the golden bananas. Yeah, yeah, that was the first game I ever played. Did you ever play Donkey Kong 64? You remember that game? <laughs> yes, I played that one quite a bit where you have like uh, the uh, orangutan kind of whatever, whatever one. And then like uh, you could play as Diddy Kong first and then you had to rescue Donkey Kong and uh, get all the gold bananas. Yeah, that, that was fun. Yeah, I think because I, I, my um, mother was actually pretty obsessed with all the Donkey Kong games. So I played at least one, uh, each of them at least at one point or another back in the day. So your parents played video games too? Uh, mostly Nintendo games. Like my dad played the uh, Diablo and StarCraft games, and he let me play like the old, old Warcraft games. Uh, he let me play two of those, but they never really into it as much as I was. I just found enjoyment them uh, because of the storylines and like uh, you know be able to you know, play all these fantasy characters online. Um, uh, my, uh, I have a sibling, a twin sister. She never got into video games. She never liked them at all. But um, she, uh, yeah. I, 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 I was pretty much like the one of my family was pretty much dedicated to video games. What is your favorite video game? Then? I would have to say, out of all the video games I've played, the one that's probably... See, Elder Scrolls Oblivion had to be it. It's probably it's probably because I'm pretty biased towards it right now because like it did bring me into the Elder Scrolls Online MMO uh, when it first came out. But Elder Scrolls Oblivion was the first Elder Scrolls game I actually touched on, and I love the stories, I love the characters, I love the progression with everything, and it was just like the game that I actually bought a 364. Like I bought an entire two hundred dollar console for this one video game. Okay, now. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to guess your favorite quest line in that series. I'm going to guess it's Dark Brotherhood. Oh, okay. When Lucy and Lashaw... Okay, we have spoilers right here for anyone who's never played this. I'll just go to play Yeah, who but... hasn't played a game that's been out for damn near 10 plus years. Spoiler alert. I am alert. polite that way. Um... No, the Dark Brotherhood was absolutely a fantastic storyline that the uh, Oblivion did, and I just, I almost cried when Lucy and Lachance died. Like, ah, that was just a heart wrenching moment. Like, they make you so, they they just like attach you to this character. You try to save him, and no matter what you do, you end up he ends up dying anyways. For me, it was Dark Brotherhood, Knights of the Nine. And Shivering Isles. I know that the the other two are basically expansions, but I don't know. I think that what really got me was the was the diary as I was scrolling through and the truth unfolded. And I was like, they definitely do good when it comes to presenting the story through in game text. I don't think there's ever been any other video game that's been able to pull that off very well. I, I guess you can um, argue Mass Effect to a certain extent. I don't know. Well, I, they've never been able to do as good a storylines as it was. But like, people can argue that the Skyrim um, storylines are great, but they just weren't so in depth. The characters were not as intriguing to me at all in Skyrim. It's as if they were focusing so much more on the uh, the game itself, the mechanics of it, that they kind of forgot that story is important as well. With Oblivion, yeah, it was a really colorful game, like too colorful like you can make an orc that glows it was so colorful <laughs> but um the storylines were they obviously had care with their storylines back then and i do remember that diary and i actually did memorize the entire thing did you why would you memorize the diary because i just i like the little poem that had it that they had in there i don't know why it was just it was good but no, like the Brotherhood storyline, I mean, the Thieves Guild storyline was really good. I mean, you got to sneak into the White Gold Tower and steal an Elder Scrolls. Let me ask you this about Oblivion. What do you think distinguishes it from Skywind or Skywind? Skyrim or Morrowind? With Oblivion, well, first of all, the graphics increase from Morrowind to Oblivion is absolutely phenomenal. And that's the reason why. I I have difficulties coming going back to Borwood. I know you shouldn't go back. You should be hesitant to go back to the game just because of graphics, especially you know, WoW's graphics haven't really changed that much from the cartoonish phases that they began with. But um, I do have difficulties with that. I mean, Morrowind's storylines were by far the best in the fact, but there are some parts of the game that were kind of a bit too much. Like 
it was in Oblivion that they introduced the uh, capacity to have a compass for uh, quests, which was really helpful, especially since the first quest, well, the first parts of the main quest of Morrowind, you had to go in and get this cube, and you had to go into this massive Dwemer ruin, and you couldn't find this thing no matter what you did, because there was no quest markers in Morrowind. And then it, after about two hours of running around and feeling like a jackass, you realize it was actually in the first room to your left and yourself. Can you give me an example when you said you said that Skyrim didn't really have any characters that intrigued you or they weren't as character intensive? Can you give me an example of that? Like, can you recall any characters to mind that you felt weren't as developed as they could be? Uh, I think a good portion of the Dark Brother. Well, I'm going to make a, like a example between the Dark Brotherhood of both the games. In the Dark Brotherhood, in the first game, you had uh, a good, like you had the Khajiit that hated you constantly until the very end when you had to kill him. You almost felt bad because of it because he finally actually accepts you as a friend, and then you have to kill him. And they had such wonderful storylines, like the Who Done It quest line, uh, which you can repeat, which I've repeated multiple times with that Has one. A funny ending. Yeah. <laughs> just to see who who would kill who and see what their reactions are in the room and then you have um uh, with the skyrim game the little cute little vampire chick she was fine and all but the other characters were just so bland almost like you got a werewolf that automatically just hates you doesn't really change or progress much you have the leader of the sanctuary who is automatically jealous of you and hates you through the entire game until the very end when she's a roasting corpse on the ground and she gives you the blade of woe um they just they weren't really as thought out well like they didn't really have that much development with them. They didn't have any unique little quirks or traits that makes them adorable or lovable. I mean, you have a red guard. This is wise red guard that kind of, you know, kind of acts like the little leader in the end who uh, helps uh, dig you up. And um, uh, it was just a typical story of okay, the leader of the sanctuary hates me, so she's willing to risk the entirety of the sanctuary to destroy me, and ends up getting fucked to the end. Okay. <laughs> Now, since we're talking about Dark Brotherhood um, comparisons here, we talk about Oblivion, we talk about Skyrim. So what do you think of the Dark Brotherhood questline in Elder Scrolls Online? See, I completed the Dark... I did the, a run-through once with the Dark Brother quest, so I just to get the Blade of Woe and get all the achievements and stuff and um, get the little motif re, get the motif where you stab someone in the heart. Uh, that one, that was so painful to get. <laughs> the questline, I mean... I know they're trying to make these storylines kind of for an MMO, but to me, it also didn't really hold that much intrigue with me. It's like almost as if there's the, the storylines for Elder Scrolls Universe kind of just kind of started dying after Oblivion. As if they were just entirely focusing way too much mechanics and gameplay to really care about the story. Um, like with the... I know that there's like... I know after Mike, Michael Kirkbride wasn't you know, doing much with the Elder Scrolls series anymore, that their storylines kind of died. But um, the storyline in Elder Scrolls Online, it was too obvious what was going to happen in the beginning, middle, and end. I mean, there was no, oh my god moments like there was in Oblivion, like with the whole Lucy and the Chance thing, where, you know, you're you're killing the silencers and, and everything. You kill the listener, and Lucy and the Chance just runs up to you and basically asks you what the fuck you're doing, and you're standing there like, you're the player, and going there, oh my god, oh my god, what have I done? I didn't see this coming at all. With these storylines, you kind of see what's going to be happening from a mile away. I don't... I don't know if Michael Kirkbride, you know, his, de his departure signal the degrading in in the game's writing because uh by his own admission he said that a number of the stuff for elder scrolls lore comes from another developer by the name of uh kurt coleman i think his name is and he's a senior writer over there at bethesda he and todd howard work closely on several of the games of course i think the most recent one was fallout 4 i don't know if they work together on fallout 76 i didn't really follow that much, much uh, very well so I wouldn't, I wouldn't attribute that to. I wouldn't attribute the degrading of storyline to Kirkbride's departure. Maybe, maybe I'm not. Maybe it's because I'm not a Kirkbride fanboy, or I think, or personally. Let me ask you this before continuing. What is your opinion of Michael Kirkbride? I absolutely adore his writings. Like with the uh, Mythic Dawn commentaries, the Lessons of Vivek. I love the philosophical, metaphysical uh, theme he added 
to the story and the writings and um, you know the the interesting uh, aspects he uh, placed in them uh, because you know with the whole chim thing too and um, you know the theory of the godhead and everything like that that you know Michael Cropra came up with I absolutely adore that kind of lore and I felt like the, the, like a good portion of that kind of went missing when he disappeared. Mm, okay, I see where you're coming from. Funnily enough, to me, it seemed those are all recycled ideas, if that makes sense. And yeah. I mean, theory of the Godhead and the dreamscape that comes from medieval literature. Um, as far as Chim is concerned, that's that's uh, poop. It was it's that one aspect of Buddhism that I can't remember. Samsara, I think it was, where you basically break free of the reincarnation cycle and achieve a level of clarity that nobody else does and. Basically, that's what Chim is, and I think his idea on Amaranth is essentially interesting, but the thing th that irks me about him is that it all goes to Morrowind. Like, um, you can definitely tell that he... he Favor the Dark Elves. Oh, yeah, definitely. I don't... I, I, I'd like to poke his brain and be like, why? Like, why the Dark Elves? What is it, you know... it. The, I, I'd like to ask the Dark Elf our peers, like, what do you think? Why do you think Michael Kirkbride favors you guys off of everybody else? But I don't, I don't know. It, um, it was pretty cool in the beginning, but sort of, kind of, as people tend to prize Kirkbride's writing, I, I think they're overstating it. In my humble opinion. I, I think he did great work for the metaphysical, but. I don't know. And, and, and the mental physical aspects and the creation aspects, great, you know, and especially since um, you have conflicting point of, points of view and the lawyer for speculation, that's also great. But other than that, I don't know. I don't think that there was a direct, I don't think there is a direct link. Even now that I'm thinking about it, even Vivek himself is kind of a ripoff character. I shouldn't say ripoff character, but his aspect, his concepts of his character stems from Shiva and Sakthi, who are separate entities of the hinduism but when they join together they become a hermaphroditic um universal force i probably explained that in a very very butchered way but the idea there is that um that's nothing new to me i i, I don't know i shouldn't say i don't know i do know now that i think about it i do wonder what kurt bride might think of elder scrolls online if he were to have a look at it and say just play through it and read through what's been established. I wonder what his reaction would be. I'll say I don't think you'd mind um, The Elder Scrolls Online. I don't think you'd find offense to it or anything like that because it was pretty good with even um, mods and that, people adding stories through mods and things like that. So I don't, I don't think you would mind The Elder Scrolls Online as story progression and everything like that. I think you're right, especially since he... Um, he came up with Coda. Oh, Coda. As the community divided, more or less. Nah, I just say the lore community, not the general community. General community don't give two shits, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, I read Coda, and I was kind of, that That was got me a bit unsure, and I was kind of just like, okay, what am I, I, I don't understand, okay. As stupid as it sounds, maybe that was the direction he wanted to take Morrowind in after Morrowind was done and if they had kept him on, perhaps, you know, he'd start steering it start steering Elder Scrolls towards that direction. But given given that they're a fantasy series, um, I don't know. We probably probably didn't think that sort of idea would conform to their focus. Which leads me to actually ask you a question. So you mentioned that before that you like dark fantasy. Do you have a favorite dark fantasy series? Uh, see, that's the thing is, is that I might enjoy dark fantasy, but honestly, I've never been able to uh, find much dark fantasy to actually read. Like, I'm more of, uh, I, I found enjoyment in the actual writing of it and the actual creation of dark fantasy. But as for the actual reading of it, I can't even place a finger on a single book I've read of dark fantasy. <laughs> okay. What makes a fantasy dark, in your opinion? I mean, a lot of people attribute dark fantasy to just being horror. I think that there's just a lot more to it. I find dark fantasy actually uh, picks up on and actually um, uses the uh, the concepts of morality in their uh, books too. Like they hone in on these uh, the the worser aspects of humanity, like murder, 
you know, uh, kidnapping, torture, assassination. And they really tried to put that in the perspective of their stories and kind of the evil side, the darker side of, you know, people and uh, really trying to uh, look at the scene through the outlook of the villain. Uh, more so than anything else. I mean, you could have the hero kind of as the perspective, but it's really trying to understand the villain and the, uh, you know, the darker, you know, side of things, you know? Then delving towards, you mentioned that um, at some point you'd like to be a writer and author fantasy series. If you had to outline, say, a few concepts to incorporate, one of them being the dark side of humanity and darker moralities and also presenting an intriguing villain what else would you add to make a fantasy dark well see i want to write something that's kind of hasn't been touched on a lot and that is kind of you know how the villain came to be because you have to understand that with a story you have there's a hero and there's a typically a villain but if there was no villain there would be there wouldn't have a need to be a hero so i think that sometimes the villain is uh, kind of forgotten and kind of left as almost just a uh, uh just as something for the hero to overcome and that is it but i think that they're highly undervalued by the fact that if it wasn't for the fact that this villain even existed and was causing all these problems, there would be no need for a hero and no need for a story. So if I start writing Dark Fantasy, I would, which I actually am, um, I write a, the perspective of the villain, actually show, you know, how they came to be and how so because i don't believe anyone's born evil i don't believe anyone you know has those traits because something happened in their life that caused them to become that and i think that's far more intriguing than a hero who kind of just held on to their morality their entire life and was the only one who had the confidence enough to stand up to the villain to me the, the villain also because of the fact that they were turned into that sometime in their, during their life, sometime during their life, they can also turn back. So the, the fact that you have this character that um, can, you know, at any time, you know, if a, if a situation presented themselves, could return to being good and actually find redemption is far more intriguing for a story to, and than, you know, just wondering if the hero will survive or not. Okay. Makes me think of Darth Vader. Great concept for execution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Better execution than that, of course, but... Of course, I'm referring to the prequel trilogy for the Star Wars fans. Let me ask you this. Did the, is that what drove you to making um, Alana just uh, trying to come up with a character that is a villain? Or because you felt that villains were underappreciated? I made Alana because I wanted to... I wanted to make a, the, a villain that I felt was appropriate um for the kind of story actually a lot of actually she was really a regs to riches kind of character um she was the villain that was of course very angry very um had plenty of flaws and really didn't know where she fitted in the world um and she was liable to outbursts to you know attacking random people and things like that um she wasn't a very good villain to begin with <laughs> uh and i made the i wanted to start her off in a way where i actually began her story like she didn't just appear out of nowhere as this as what she is now a cult leader and holding a lot of uh yeah, holding a lot of respect, a lot of very cunning, uh, very cruel. She didn't begin out like this. I wanted to start off her story to see how what type of villain she would eventually become in the end. And um, the character, her concept didn't really come from anything. It was more of my ideas on what character would to begin this kind of thing would be best with. In fact, I never actually began her in the Riz or leading a guild. She was actually a character in another guild. Uh, that I joined before I actually created the Razor. And um, her progression and everything that's happened to her was never anything planned at all. It just sort of happened and progressed to the story, and she soon became this kind of arch-villain type. That's uh, about 90% of, I think, roleplay characters that come say, yeah, we never had a plan, it just sort of happened. And well, uh, here we are now. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. It's when I first uh, started our paying the character. She was um, I was in a guild called the Withered Hand for about two years. Uh, it was I'm in sorry, the what were they called? The the Withered Hand. Yes, it was the name of the um, cult oh, and the Withered the Hand. Gotcha, the Withered Hand. Gotcha. Yeah, and um, that was actually my first time RPing. Um, I'm actually 
pretty new to the RP scene in comparison to these decade long RP. We've well, actually been RPing for about four years. Um, and when the character began, she, I kind of just, you know, let whatever happened, um, her powers, her philosophies, her uh, I idealisms and all that, that all came from the RP. Like most of the time it was just people giving me stuff in the RP or giving me stories that kind of just trans transformed the character until eventually two years after I joined the hand, eventually the guild kind of just kind of went kaput. And that's kind of when with the racer, and that's when she became the cult leader, and she became uh, a very scheming, almost metamarco esque, but far better than what Elder Scrolls betrays it type of character. Now, scrolling it back here, since you said that the Withered Hand was your first guild, how did you first get into roleplay? Entirely by accident. <laughs> um, I never intended to RP. Actually, I. Uh, I actually went played Elder Scrolls online uh, due to you know being a fan of the Elder Scrolls series. I was purely a PVE player. I didn't even know what RP was. Um, back in the day when this game first launched, there was too many glitches to count. I mean, quests couldn't be handed over. NPCs wouldn't work. Zones were completely glitched to all hell. Stairs were just just sucked you into a void. Um, when I was in the East March zone, I completed everything in the zone, and I was actually completing the main quest part to try and move on to the Rift zone. Except the NPC in that zone kind of broke, and went give up. It went and went give the needed quest to continue over to the Rift, and so I was stuck there waiting for this NPC to give me the quest to access the next zone because I wanted to finish the main quest and finish the game, and I couldn't do that until this NPC actually, you know, did its job. So while Sauce was uh, fixing it. Um, me and a few others, we started, you know, just, you know, just fucking around with the NPC, pretending, you know, kind of like pretending to kill it and, you know, try to take the quest from it. We didn't know at the time they were RPing or just PBE or so, we just fucking around. Um, and this guy sent me a PM and asked me if I was interested in RPing. And my first question was, <laughs> what's RP? <laughs> and he invited me to his guild, and the guild only lasted lasted three days so it was like one of those guilds that quickly just die um but when during the time that i was actually trying to rp i met someone in the withered hand and uh we both eventually uh you know i joined their guild and you know i that's when i started rping but i didn't had no intention to even make a lot of wasn't even meant to be a pve like a P, rp character she was entirely meant to be a pve character i mean i just went into the rp with her just because she happened to be the character i was on when i was doing the quests. and from there you took a few steps into a larger world well yeah like i've always been kind of um shy about my writing in the beginning um like it was something that was pretty like it was important to me and you know i was I was too shy and timid to like show anyone else my writing, so RP took a lot out of me. Um, but I have to attribute it to the one reason as to why I'm actually going to be able to actually become an author is because it did give me the uh, confidence in my writing to actually be able to do that. But in the beginning, I was just putting in like half paragraph, like half a sentence post because I was so terrified with other people thought. I mean, the third day into RPing, I was ecstatic that I managed to make the letters turn purple. Well, when you say half sentence, you know, emotes, does that mean that post length matters to you? Well, I'm more like, you know, it was kind of just like walks into a room sort of thing. Okay, concerned for the quality of your emotes. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with the quality of like my posts and things like that. But it's, uh, like uh, what we always attribute, especially in the razor, the length of your post, the quality of your post doesn't matter as long as you're trying. That's just me being anal about my own posts. But if anyone else comes up, walks up to me, and only gives me like three words, okay, I, I'll still adore your writing. <laughs> but no, when I, it was more of the attributing to the fact that um, when I started writing, I could have done a lot more when I first started doing posts, but I didn't because I was just terrified and wanted to do as little writing as possible so that, you know, I wasn't going to be judged or anything because I was very, uh, no, not very confident about my writing in the beginning and RP really helped that. It sounds like it was something over time, like the more you did it, the more you were able to get acclimated to the medium and eventually, you know, start writing more and increase your, the quality by your own standards. Yeah, I mean, the Withered Hand really helped with that. Um, it was a guild that was 
that I had a lot of friends in there and they really helped help me out with it. They, you know, they made me feel comfortable with writing. Even if I did, if I fucked up like, you know, entire RP or whatever, or made mistakes here and there, they never yelled at me or shouted at me or rolled their eyes and made sarcastic comics. And I think that that's really important for a guild to do because there's gonna, probably gonna be quite a few people out there that are like me who are just shy and didn't want to like, put everything, you know, in their little chat box as much as they could just because they're just nervous about the entire room of people seeing it. So uh, that, uh, I think that, you know, just having a bunch of people to support you and just, you know, berate you for mistakes really, really help. So can you recall to me what your first role play experience was like? So uh, I'm imagining that that person that PM'd you asked you to join the RP guild and then introduces you to what RP is. Yeah, that one was kind of, it was like about, tw it was about two minutes interview, and then they that kind of released me to uh, Tavern RP. So there wasn't really anything that was memorable about it. It, was, it wasn't actually until the Withered Hand that I actually got the first memorable RP, and where, you know, I was pretty much like dumbfounded by RP and stories and, you know, the creating of them. It was actually terrifying, and I almost <laughs> shut off my computer and walked away. Um, uh, the person who found me from the first guild I was in, um, he uh, introduced me to the Withered Hands GM. And we all met, they, I met him in a tavern. I didn't know it was him, first of all. I'm pretty sure my character kind of insulted his character uh, first off the bat, which is not a good introduction. Um, but then the Withered Hand was also kind of a cultish feel to it. And um, the other members of the Withered Hand kind of also began to enter the tavern. And all of a sudden, the GM of the Withered Hand announced that they were all going to go to this ruin or whatever, and that my character would come with. Well, now I'm going to the middle of nowhere with about like eight other people. I have no idea who they are. I'm terrified for my character because I know this is an evil cult, and I know that any one of them at any time would just turn around and just stab my character because I didn't know, because I was new to RP, so I didn't know the RP rules. So I didn't know there was a rule against uh, no killing without consent. So I was terrified for my character. And I, so I was just thinking in my head, okay, three days in, guys. Now I'm done. Okay, this is fun. Um, and going to this ruin, they actually, um, that was when they did the IC interview for my character. And I just remember the entirety of this cult standing around, circling my character with the G GM's character kind of like talking to mine about like, you know, about their opinion of the alliances and, you know, what they want in life and things like that. And me being absolutely terrified because it was really, really intense RP. And me just wanted to shut, shut off my laptop and run away. But um, my character eventually said, yes, join the Withered Hand. But it was like the most intense um, moment probably I've had, like one of the few intense moments I've had in the RP like that. Or what was intense about it, the fact that they were just throwing you to the wolves right off the bat? It just sounds like what they did is... It was pretty much a moment where you have eight people standing in the middle, like you're alone, first of all, you don't, know, you don't even know who these people are even like as players. You've never talked to any of them. They're surrounding your poor little character and going, so what's your opinion on the world? And you know, there's like pretty much have their knives out and ready. And you know, you're, you're kind of looking around going, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh, what, what's, what is the dialogue option for me to live? <laughs> What's the dialogue option for Vito? I gotta remember that one. Now, just to make sure and make sure to stipulate, so this was um, Alana that you were do that you were RPing on. Yeah, for the longest time, Alana was my only character. Okay, so she is your first character and your oldest. Yes, and she is currently the leader of the Crimson Light Razor now. Right. So, what got it into your head to be like? Okay, uh, that guild fell under. You know what? I'm going to make it. I'm going to lead a guild myself, you know, because it seems like a big step up from what you're telling me right now. Well, I was terrified of the perspective. I, I will admit that. Um, I never actually, you know, consider myself much of a leader or even uh, capable of doing anything like this. And certainly not with a dark guild, because from what I can see, dark guilds, they have a struggle getting up and running and i had it in my head to build the most evilest darkest just most just cruelest guild out there i see Lee. so i thought i honestly thought i was gonna fail in the first week uh but as of the reason as to why i made the guild um 
I mean, I had a bunch of friends in the guild. I mean, we all adored talking to each other and RPing with each other. And I didn't want to lose that. I didn't want to lose them. I didn't want us all just like uh, jumping ship to another guild where, you know, who knows what could happen. So I wanted to make a guild for them. And I mean, the other, because I was an officer in the Withered Hand eventually. And um, the other two officers that were with me, they weren't... They weren't. They weren't just gonna try and. Uh, they weren't gonna step up and uh, make the guild. So I pretty much said, "Fuck it. We're gonna do this. I'm gonna lead it. I'll do our best. Let's just hope it doesn't. We can last at least a week, guys." <laughs> and eventually, it built and built and built. And you know, after um, getting used to being GM and getting used to the headaches and the problems and understanding how to actually lead a guild and how to work at work everything, I think. Uh, I figured it out. Like there's always, there's always gonna be problems. There's always gonna be new things around the corner. But um, eventually, we managed to get our shit together, and I think we're doing pretty good. <laughs> Let's derail a little bit. I want to talk to you about Alana. You gave some of her background story just a little bit, saying that she was liable to outbursts. What's what's the story behind her? She. Obviously, uh, anyone that's listening, um, she can't take this um, information to, to metagame or anything like that. But I'm curious because much of her early life, nobody really knows. And she has expertly placed lies and deceits from rumors of uh, being enslaved by Nords or being cuffed in Nordic hands or something. I, th- I think that was the phrase, which yeah. I saw. And as a Nord RP, I was like, what? Just play the Nords. What? What? <laughs> Nords would living. never do that. I'm curious. How how did she come into the world? With uh, her, the, ever, you have to understand that when I first began her backstory, um, I was still relatively new to the RP and it's been shifted adjusted to more lore appropriate standards. And it's been something that's kind of like doesn't really come up up into the rp uh anymore her backstory like um her backstory i really adore the daedra lore of the elder scrolls series like it's my favorite type of lore um and i probably have memorized every aspect of it um with alana uh i wanted her to be born on a daedric plane uh, but i um wanted to also be able to RP it out. Uh, this isn't a Vester story, mind you, but yes, she was born at Cold Harbor, um, mainly because of when I looked into the lore, only those who died in Cold Harbor or died by Mole or died uh, being, um, you know, you know, sacrificed to Molek Ball becomes soul servant. So that was safe enough uh, for me to do. Um, there's been tweaks to like explain that whole thing. There was actually the Herb Tart backstory goes back like, three generations as the explanation of why everything happened with her um but yeah the character um due to her father's worship of uh moleg ball and an incident that happened with her mother who was uh, non knowing of the worship she was uh born in uh cold harbor um and she kind of just like grew up there for about 12 years, but it wasn't for the remaining six years that Daedra actually caught on of her existence because she was kind of hidden away for a bit in there. Um, she did end up uh, escaping, but it wasn't by her uh, doing. Um, it's one of the, the two, three top da- Daedra princes I absolutely adore are Molag Ball, Klafka's File, and Mayron's Dagon. Even before the yeah, game. I can understand Maroon's Dagon and Molag Ball, but Clavicus Vile? Really? Clavicus Vile is the Prince of Power, and it's not the power of supernatural sense, the power of, pol- of people, words, politics, which I think is an interesting concept for me to do. It kind of also explains his little artifact with the mask of Molag Ball, why attraction is a thing for it. Um, and I think he's a prince that's kind of like kind of overlooked a lot in the amount of power he could have. I mean, political power and the power he wields is the thing that pretty much, you know, is the whole thing with Imperials. <laughs> and they almost conquered Tamriel. Well, he did conquer Tamriel, but... um, He did. Well, yeah. And it's that kind of power that really spurns even the character even now. How did he conquer Tamriel? Well, no, no, I mean, like, like the, the Imperials, the power of... Oh, the Imperials, gotcha, right, right, yeah. gotcha. It's the same type of power that they used 
um, to pretty much so conquer of Tamarind. The bargain making sort of thing. Bargains and you know be able to be uh, the power like that people place in things you know with kingdoms and politics and things like that that kind of power. So my character, when she was in Cold Harbor, probably around the age of 14, she made a wish to escape. Now, due to previous circumstances, two generations down along the way, uh, her soul was actually already uh, promised to Clavis File, um, which I actually wrote a, I think it was like a 35,000 word story explaining it. Um, it's, it's on my, it's on the website, um, where, she, her mother pretty much ran away from her family after her, after the first born child of her was to be promised by Clav to Clavicus Vile, which eventually would be Alana, which is why when she made the wish, which actually is uh, tethered to Clavicus Realm's sphere, Clavicus Vile saw the opportunity to be able to open the portal to technically rescue Alana from Cold Harbor. And it was, the deal was to serve him, and she would never have to fear Cold Harbor again, which is kind of what happened. And then circumstances eventually evolved in his realm, which thank God they finally released the name of. Well, they took him so it took him a few decades. That really bothered me that I had to run around and every time I explained her backstory, it was always Clavicus Vile's realm. Um, <laughs> but uh, eventually she escaped and ended up on Nurn. Now, I chose kind of a more of outlandish story of her, you know, being born in Cold Harbor and then serving in Clavicus Vile's realm and finding her way to Nurn. Not because so I could have a character that could run around and say, oh yeah, you know, I'm from a day play, lols. But for, there was actually two reasons. One, O and C, one, I see. The I see reason is because I found it very intriguing to have a character that knew nothing about Nurn and kind of had this almost alien perspective of it. Like, Characters on Nern would perceive Oblivion as this outlandish, outplaced, otherworldly area. Well, she would view she would view Nern that way, and now she's in this alien planet that you know she can hardly understand, and right, she can't it's understand. Right, version right there. Yeah, yeah, where she had to try to f figure out society. She's trying to figure out how people you know interact with each other. She had a very daedric mindset about her because you know she was kind of that's all she grew up with. And I found that very intriguing to RP a character as that. The O of C reason, and this goes back to my um, newishness to RP, I wanted to make a character that, because I already knew that there was already stories, there was already guilds already happening, there was already arcs and communities and things like that. And I was pretty much uh, going into this entire thing with a, like in the center of the book, not knowing a thing about anyone. And... I thought maybe that would actually be something of a hindrance to my character who probably should know everything that's happening around her and, you know, all these guilds and communities and all these storylines they've done. So I want to have a character who also had an icy explanation as why she knew nothing. Because <laughs> I knew nothing about what was happening. But, um... She wandered. She went to Nern, and for about three years, she kind of just like wandered around. And because of the fact that she really had zero understanding of society, of how to interact with people, and you know the, the Tamriel as a whole, um, she didn't fit in at all. Like she was just kind of just lost and wandering around. She had anger issues. She was very volatile. Um, and eventually, she eventually, you know, wandered her way into a tavern where she joined that first guild and eventually joined the Withered Hand, where the Withered Hand became her first real home. And it was kind of a, it was weird that a cult would be her first kind of home, because then that kind of also uh, grew her perspective of the world. It, you know, a cult life kind of became the normal life for her. Kind of seems full circle to me. I mean, yeah. she, her her parents. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. I, the feeling I got were that her father was in, and her, her and the two generations going back might have been in a more like ball cult, and then she ends up escaping only to end up in another cult. It seems to follow a certain trend there. I think. Yeah. Well, her father. Um... Her father was a deeply devout Molek Ball worshipper, and he ended up slaughtering his family because, you know, he started hearing voices and thought Molek Ball would be pleased by it. Like, he was absolute deranged, fanatical worshipper. Um, her mother, who was the imperial of the family, was actually from an imperial nobility house. And um, the family was just a typical merchant nobility house. And they were going, they were, they were not doing well. 
their business was doing bad. They tried to make uh, bets in the Kavach arena and that started failing. And now there's suddenly they're owing money lenders. They're owing all these people. They're going to get the shit beaten out of them. They didn't give their money back. So they were desperate. And they eventually they went to Shrine Clock's file to ask for assistance. And of course, the typical give me souls for, you know, and your fortunes will turn. They did that until they ran out of, you know, serpents to give to Clavicus Vile. And the, so Clavicus Vile demanded that the firstborn child of the uh, house's uh, daughter, which the firstborn child of her would eventually be Alana, um, would be given to Clavicus Vile. The mother, Alana's mother, uh, didn't like this at all. She was a very pure soul like she was having problems with the clavicus file worship in her family but you know she was kind of pacified into you know when they explained that it was for the family like it's you know it's for a good we'll stop when we get enough wealth but then that never happens with danger cults um and she ran away and her father who was so distraught by his uh, daughter running away uh, from went to clavicus file and said enough i'm not doing anymore i'm out of the deal i want my daughter back and uh, Clavix File pretty much turned around and said, okay, sure, um, I'll end the deal. You can, Your family will keep your wealth and none may touch it, but you have to gather your family and just collect an urn for me in this ruin because I can't access it. And when you open the urn, I'll collect what's inside. And they did that. And so when I made this story, I wanted to make it as much Clavix File fashion as possible. So when the family went to the... Um, ruin where this like urn i guess was their souls were sucked inside and clavicus file would collect it and that is how the family ended up dying and the wealth of the family was actually cursed and anyone who enters their uh, the family's estates somewhere in the clovian highlands they would almost be like repelled from touching anything so their wealth was pretty much left to gather dust and clavicus file was kind of waiting for the mother's child to be born so he can claim the soul which wouldn't happen until a lot of made the wish in cold harbor I can only imagine all those bandits that are sneaking into the estate trying to get to the uh, the wealth stores. I wonder what would happen to them. They they pretty much look at it and they like feel almost disgusted by the thought of taking it, and they kind of just walk away without leaving. It was actually really funny when I had like the 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 crimson razor going to the um the uh, mansion to kind of explore because they recently did the story of actually finding this part out about Lana's uh, backstory and um. It was funny watching all the thieves in the guild just standing around looking very confused as to why there was nothing in their pockets yet. <laughs> okay, okay. So then moving on from her time in the Withered Hand to assuming leadership over the Crimson Razor, I imagine that that sort of leadership or the, the way she developed her leadership skills was definitely a process over time. Oh, God, yes. She would never have been a leader if it wasn't for the RP that happened. Can you point to me a pivotal moment where she sort of, I shouldn't say not as a catalyst, but it was a definitely a pivotal moment to where her leadership skills just, or her leadership skill just exploded all the way to like level 100 or whatever. Does that make sense? Have I lost you with that question? See, it wasn't a singular moment, though. It was, like, uh, numerous things that happened. Like, when her... Because in the RP, um, in The Withered Hand, the GM of The Withered Hand, his main character actually adopted my character, um, Alana, as his daughter. And he actually started uh, teaching her about, you know, magic and things like that. And um, started kind of trying to teach her to kind of uh, look away from the, her history and not be like uh, regressed by it and kind of moving forward by it. And then there was instances where she was forced to grow and she was forced to realize there was more than just her in the world. And uh, eventually um, she started to, um, she started looking at her own back life and realizing, you know, she was in cap captivity at Cold Harbor. She was enslaved. There's nothing she can do. And she started to actually hate the Daedra a lot um and right now she is a character that is bent on trying to bring um freedom to nerd but i have to give her the whole um the reason the thing the thing about the villain characters that the ones i adore the most are the ones that are what they preach sounds good 
but the intention is wrong. <laughs> um, with her, yeah, she preaches of the fact that she wants to bring freedom to her and she wants to do all of this and that too. And, you know, uh, try to free people from both Daedra and Aedra because she feels as if that mortals are actually the supreme species in the universe. And the Daedra are just liars that, you know, that, you know, should be serving mortal kind. And this whole idea of freedom from her sounds good, at, you know, on paper. Except when you realize that, that you know, the Razor has slaves. And anyone that says no to her is kind of going to be killed. <laughs> so you got to wonder what kind of freedom that is. Um, but for her, how she became like the leader of the Razor. And became so dramatically different when she, when she began. Like, if you put the two characters side by side, they're completely different. Like, I still have her old journal entries. And they're nothing like they are now. Actually, right now, they're so metaphorical and philosophical that most that a lot of people can't understand them hell ha half the time when i like read back through them I'm like what the fuck was i writing <laughs> but um <laughs> but um no the characters too uh another thing that happened is she started actually did have a kind of deity to eventually along the way uh she believes in the uh pride more force of chaos she is a devout follower to part of a sithis lorcan and believes that with the whole the whole creation story of um, the Mundus, that was another thing that kind of like um, started to change the character too. But the whole you know the whole, whole Potame striking out an Anu and boom creation. <laughs> um, she kind of attributes that as the only way to kind of remake the world because she feels as if the world's like too corrupt right now. That you know the Daedra and the Aedra are trying to enslave mortal kind. Mortals kind of forgotten the truth of their creation. That they are pretty much like the holders of both of both light and dark of the universe. Thus should be like and the fact they're in the center of the Arubis. And it's a character that um, God, I'm going on a tangent right now. Um, yeah, we've been on a tangent since this question began. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm liable to tangents. Um, with the character's belief in like chaos and everything like that, uh, she believes that chaos is the only cure to the world. That with the whole uh, balancing scheme of the world, um, it when great chaos is you know bestowed on the universe, that great peace and light should also have to come from it because the, ba the universe eventually has to balance itself out. And because of the fact that Padme in the beginning struck out at Anu um, and to create the world and actually get the ball going, she believes that's the only the blueprint of remaking the world into a better one. So the Razor's entire goal is literally to strike at the world with as much chaos as possible in the hopes of almost of remaking it to one that the, a lot of perceives is one of like actual freedom. So random question, how many times are you pelted with that little finger quote where he's like, chaos is a ladder? <sighs> too many times. To be fair, I had this guilt going like, before I watched that episode. <laughs> but, but. To my original question, can you recall a specific role play scenario where her behavior, when you look at her behavior, it was markedly different from how you would expect she would react? Does that make sense? Um, probably. Well, like you know, when when the when the two characters started to kind of like when the one character kind of started to diverge into these two separate characters, her past self and her current self. Um, like I said, her father, uh, I see, um, did a lot of training with her, a lot of meditation, a lot of trying to kind of calm, you know, the, 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 the inferno in her, um, and try to teach her how to actually, you know, be, because he was a very uh, monk-like mindset, surprising for a villain, but he kind of passed that along to the character, um, which sort of began this whole process. It was difficult. Like, uh, the, anyone who can have characters that kind of have the very anger, very antagonistic attitude, it is excruciatingly difficult to do character regression with them, because you, you constantly rebound with them. Um, so it was a very long process with her. And I think the moment when I kind of realized the character was so absolutely different was um, there was a Dramora that was kind of uh, constantly attacking the withered hand and was uh, kind of acting as our kind of main antagonist for a while. Um, in this battle uh, between the Jamora and Alana, actually, because the Jamora ended up getting a very personally a personal vendetta against her, uh, the character started stopped re realized that attacking in kind of a um, one linear manner, like attacking without thinking, you know, just you know brute force or whatever, wouldn't work. 
She had the scheme. She had to think calmly. She had to be tactical about it. She had to take a few steps back and actually see the entirety of the scenario as it was, rather than just, you know just seeing something and moving like jumping on it. Because oftentimes that ended up you know not working out really out well in her favor. Um, and when the character started learning how to do that, and then you know coupled with you know her meditations and trying to be more of a uh, calmer demeanor and more of a schemer and tactical thinker. She slowly began to progress on this until finally you can't tell you can't you can't tell that the past character is even related to uh, this character at all. Like uh, even if with like I said with her journal entries, in the beginning her journal entries typically went along along the lines of I'm so pissed off with this. I hate this. God, I hate Nern. Fuck this shit. I'm going back to oblivion. Um, now it's typically about probably about 5,000 words of just metaphors and philosophies and uh, very, very um, thoughtful thinking on her end. Like she's not a villain that just does knee jerk reactions anymore. She's not a villain who just attacks just wh the first emotion that comes to her head. She's one that. That is very, very tactical, tactical, very cunning. And honestly, when you talk to her, she's completely calm. Now, I imagine a character like that that is, while calm, yes, is always trying to build the chaos a bit more and is also speaking in metaphors and delving into philosophies. Does that get, ever get exhausting after a while? You know, just that sort of intensity to the character? It is. She's, from before, she became probably the most well the most beloved character for me to rp i would come on every day and rp on her and it was easy for me to do and i enjoyed the rp and i have to admit despite the fact i adore the character now i adore the way that she's progressed and how much more of a person that she's become to find she's almost like this superficial thing in the razor like uh, the other characters kind of don't even treat her as a person anymore um but with that also comes with the fact that she is very exhausting to RP and I can't RP with her that much anymore because honestly doing that every day would just, uh, I would just, uh, yeah, I would just throw, I would just, I would just pass out on my keyboard after a while. Cause oftentimes I just have to sit there and I have to really, really focus on her. Like I'm constantly like downing coffee when I have to do RP on her. Um, and I don't, usually rp on her that much anymore like it's a rare thing for the guild to actually see the character hmm. but how do you mean when you say they don't treat her as a person anymore in in what way do you mean by that like they don't say hey alana how's it going or no they don't the um the razor because when i when i rp a lot with the guild like her her interaction with the guild is not what I commonly see a lot of uh, GMs doing with their RP characters, uh, with their guild, like the interaction between the two, you don't see her at all. You, she gives out orders um, from afar, and they obey it. It's the character. There was a few reasons why I did this. Is not just because of the character's perspective and her mentality and things like that, and the fact that she's having a very, she has a very difficult time actually relating to people anymore now um she i don't want the guild to um make mistakes and have uh the the razor's leader come down on their heads with an axe i want the characters i want people to be able to do their arcs and their storylines as as they want without worry of constantly being berated i see, having the characters berated i see like, make mistakes and be able to clean up after them and to learn from them uh even alana too she her even her own mentality actually fits with that because she'd rather see her uh, guild actually make these mistakes and um be able to like grow from them and grow stronger from it um <sighs> And also, the character is, because of the fact, you have to understand with an evil cult, you constantly have to be top dog. It's different from the good guilds, in a sense, in the fact that the person who's at the top has to be the most powerful, because they're constantly going to be challenged or backed. These are evil characters. Like, they're constantly going to be trying, anyone would want to try and kill Lana to get the crown, which is why the person on top has to be the most powerful, which is why she is, I will admit, way too OP. But to kind of uh, this was this isn't to ensure that um, you know someone doesn't come along 
and tries to fuck up the guild obviously by trying to do something in that matter which i'm sure it had try happens every now and again given the fact that you play uh uh, are you role playing in quote unquote evil guild and naturally the white knights and the other RPers will sniff about and be like, Oh, there's a target. That well, sort yeah. of thing. And it gets really ultra, ultra competitive, I imagine. Yeah, which is why the character naturally is already way too OP. But I kind of like recovered this by making it so the character is never seen. I mean, like if I brought, I purposely don't bring my main to any events or to any story arcs unless I am explicitly asked to come. And they have to do quite a bit convincing for me to actually come to them because literally a lot of just ex machia the shit out of everything. Um, and I don't want them. I want them to be able to do their storylines. I want them to have the freedom of being able to write and do their arcs and have their characters make mistakes, make stupid decisions, and have their characters progress from it. Um, so. I kind of almost gave her a Sothasil mindset in that way, a very distant leader um, who's kind of there and kind of almost this intrinsic figure that they kind of um, obey without question. And from what I've seen from the perspective of the guild, it's done two things um, to the characters in, in the Razor. And anyone can, can see it when they join the Razor, like this this kind of perspective from the guild i see towards lana um she's become a she's a figure that's not your friend she's not someone you can just like ask you know um about you know your, your day with or sit down and have tea with she's this uh, figure that you'll never see never talk to and you obey and it's it's interesting how they manage to handle it like it's almost like i said it's very so like almost with her yeah i understand i understand it reminds me of um how some darths in the tour eu community take some approaches where they'll have their characters from a distance in order to have a they have a wide oversight but they're distant so that it also adds a bit of barriers to the character and that way they're insulated and protected and as well as you know they aren't helicopter parenting over their guild and sort of yeah anyway from that then i gotta ask um she is she is married yes who is she married to uh ax and vahir mm-hmm. and how did them two meet i'm curious I uh, remember i mentioned the guy that was came that introduced her to the withered hand that was him ah uh... So it all begins with that, yeah. It began actually with a slash bucket splash because Axon, um, who is actually uh, now my fiance in RL. Um, <laughs> wow, that's nice. Congratulations to the two of you. Yeah, he. Um, when we first did our first RP in the tavern a long, long time ago, he we did a quick RP. Like I said, a lot. I was a very angsty teenager, very immature back in the day, and uh, I, I can't, Axon started playing the lute. Uh, his character and my character got angry about that and shot him with a lightning bolt and um, then stormed out of the inn. And then later, uh, oh, silly, uh, Axe of the Wire came up to my to my avatar and did slash bucket splash at me, did the LOL emote, then ran back to the tavern. And I was just like looking at him going, okay, this RP isn't finished now. So I have a character storm back in and, you know, kind of like, uh, uh, and the two got into an argument and eventually took a walk together and they started like, you know, just a lot of kind of revealed uh, her relationship with the Daedra and actually kind of revealed the fact that he was in a cult and invited Alana to join. And that's where that story began. And from there, it was all downhill. It was Very all much. downhill from there. Okay, oh, God. that's cool. So now, them two, it's a little different because now I'm, there's a little bit of a, a question on my part about Nahava. Because Nahava is, uh, how old is she? In her 30s? Yeah, she's in her 30s in the fir- right. so first. So, how did she war. come about from, yeah, how did she come about? Well, when Axe and Alana, they kind of were, uh, when they were in the cult, they grew a lot more closer. Eventually, they got married. Um, what happened there is actually Lanava, the pregnancy with Ahava was completely unexpected. Lana actually originally didn't want children. And there is actually a really good IC reason for that. Because every single pregnancy that character had to witness, 
beforehand, the woman almost nearly died, or is this this agonizing, overdramatic ordeal that happened where, you know, we didn't know if the character was going to survive or not. So Alana was thoroughly freaked out about pregnancy and thinking it was like this death sentence at this point, because there was about three pregnancies she had to watch that was like that. So when Nahav, when she realized she was pregnant with Nahav, or Navi, as a lot of people like to call her, um, she panicked and she was terrified. And um, when she was time to actually, uh, you know, give birth to Navi, uh, it, it wasn't a bad one. Like, it was a pretty normal one. Um, the other ones had, like, exceptional circumstances with them. Um, and Navi, because, like I said, Navi is a very difficult character for me, because, like I said previously, I don't believe anyone's... You like to play difficult characters, don't you? Yeah, I like to challenge myself. <laughs> Give myself headaches. Um, Navi, um, like I said, the characters aren't born evil, I don't think. I don't think anyone's born evil. I think it's circumstance. So, and because of the fact this character never had a backstory, never had anything with her, she was just born in the RP, I never actually had a, um, reason for her to be evil, like her mother, uh, or her father, or anything like that. So the character grew up good, and because of the fact that Lana was determined to ensure that this her daughter never had the painful, tormenting life that she had in the beginning. And obviously, life was pretty damn good in the beginning. And there's no reason for her to be evil. Like, she even started developing her own moralities that went against a, a lot of acts and against murdering people. She was a very, very soft soul in the beginning. And she eventually ran away uh, from home after the. when she, tr she tried to join the Razor. And the other characters kind of <laughs> saw the for her kind of like, you know, her softness, her compassion, and saw it as weakness and started tormenting her. And, and uh, one thing led to another, and she just ended up running away from home. She ended up joining an order of uh, Paladins of Stendor. And that just, eventually the Paladins of Stendor attacked the Razor, and she ended up getting... And she ended up getting what? Sorry, it kind of cut out there. She, uh, she ended up getting captured. And eventually, she was persuaded back into the racer. And now, when you say to... persuaded, you obviously torture and such. Torture, brainwash, whatever we could do. <laughs> hey, all the days work. Pretty much. Actually, this afternoon, I'm getting a character horribly, horribly, horribly tortured. So that's gonna be fun. This afternoon. Well, this evening, actually. Oh, okay, gotcha. I was a little confused for a second. So the character came back um, and is now a dedicated worshiper of Mephala now. Uh, sex and lies is always fun to, well, sex and secrets, really. It's always fun to RP uh, with with the character. So she has these kind of uh, darker undertones now, and she's trying to readjust herself, except Alana, because of her perspective of the fact that Daedra are um, the lesser species in the world and that mortals um, are the I don't know, the ones who are should be the ones ruling over them doesn't exactly appreciate it. So Navi, her theme throughout our P has always been the rebellious soul of her family, but her brother, who was actually played by Axon, uh, has always been the one that's always been like a mommy's boy. It's always doing what mo what mother always tells them to do. So it's interesting because the two constantly fight whenever they're in a room. <laughs> The third character that I want to talk about, and she is a necromancer. Funnily enough, necromancers will be a class come uh, come the next expansion. Vinny Vieira. Did I, did I say that right? Yeah, Vinny Vieira. Vinny Vieira. So how did she come about? She was a character that I really wanted to uh, test her on. It was a character concept that I was unused to and honestly was very almost uncomfortable with because... Alana was is never a sexualized character. Like she was, she's like a very, uh, I I want to say clean villain. It's like the best way I could describe it. Like her concepts have never been this overly sexualized uh, type of character. She's always this, always been this almost this force, uh, almost like Sauron esque type of thing. Um, with Vinavera, I wanted to uh, what, V. Uh, sh with V, I wanted to do something a bit different and actually want to delve into that. And Nutcarmancy has always been an RP that kind of has intrigued me and kind of has been something that I wanted to try out. So I wanted to do two concepts at once. And with V, she is actually a sadomasochist necromancer. Oh, the fun that could be had there. You put sadomasochism, you stamp it with necromancy, and oh my 
god, the fun you can have with the RP. So now, quick question. Are you going to re-roll her when Necromancer class comes out, or are you just going to make a clone of her? Maybe it really depends on how worthwhile... I guess the abilities is. I've noticed that ever like before, I constantly use the abilities in game in the RP kind of just for special effects purposes. And now I'm finding myself I just don't like. I'll even go out and get mementos for just for RP sakes, and I find myself just either forgetting I have them or not knowing using them. So I'm probably not gonna re-roll her only for the fact. Well, first of all, she's an imperial, so that that seems to already be a magicka class. So I might as well bring an altmer into that. Okay. What is it about V that you enjoy the most as compared to, say, Navi or uh, Alana? With V, it's very different. The Even the very atmosphere of the RP. Like, she is a very uh, seductive character. I don't mean seductive in the sense where she erps f- around with every character. Actually, if every character standing in a row in the razor were to ask to raise their hands, who has actually slept with V, only one would raise their hand. Cause because she's seductive in the sense that she will seduce someone to get her way, but she'll kind of just kind of just mosey them off to the side when she's done. Like she'll flirt, and she'll you know she's very a Lilith type character in that sense. Lilith from most well, series kind of have her portrayed as kind of this seductive central character. Like a lot of them do go into the whole uh, she kind of sleeps around. Like Darksiders really went into the whole you know kind of, she kind of just fucked around with everyone who was most powerful. But uh, it's more of the whole very uh, evil seductress type of thing that's going on with her. And it was like like I said like uh, the sexualized characters I was at first very uncomfortable with and uh, at first because you know. It's a kind of a gray area in the RP, whether you should or should not do it. Um, and it was kind of, it was a lot of fun for me to do. Especially when you, when you add the whole necromancy, the control of souls and tormenting and torture spells and uh, all that jazz into it. It became a character that I can like do something vastly new with her that I couldn't do with all my other characters. Like you can't see, like Navi now only recently with her with follow worship can kind of start veering off into that direction. But before that, uh, none of the characters acted like V did. None of the characters would approach a situation like V did or see it in that kind of scenario. And I found that very refreshing for me to be able to do that. Okay. Now comparing them side by side, how would V approach a situation to comparing to how would Navi approach a situation? Um, V would, depending on the situation, she would try to find a way to trap probably, uh... They have to kill somebody. They have to kill someone? Okay, yeah, V would be the whole, you know, try and seduce them and drag them off into a room and basically just doing off in private. And, uh, or even drag them into an unknown location so she can, like, torture them for a bit because she is a, a sadist. But, um, and, you know, taking their soul and uh, doing it there. Navi would probably just walk up to the person and just kill them. Very straightforward. She's very yeah. She's a very straightforward character. She doesn't uh, want to just. She doesn't want to blunder around, and you know, she just wants to get the job done and go. Speaking towards Navi's perspective, real quick, compared to what she was taught to when she, uh, when she was taught when she was in the Paladins of Stendar, now worshiping Mafala, is there sort of any um, how should I say regret there, or is there any lingering effects of that indoctrination from the Knights of Stendar that might have her? you know, doubling back every now and then. Does that make sense? Or, you know, if she were to, does she ever reminisce about those, about her time as a paladin? She, honestly, she, I right by this point, she regrets even being a part, uh, worshiping the Hadra at this point or the divines or anything like that. Because, mm. um, see, a, a lot, the way a lot of managed to convince her that, you know, worshiping Stendar was wrong was actually the same reason as to why she absolutely cannot stand the divines so when she was in cold harbor i would imagine there was plenty of people calling out for the divines for aid and you know trying for them to save them and no one answering and alana kind of showed her that and the fact that there's these planes in oblivion where these people being suffering and tormented and the divines don't give two shits and or either are either too powerless to help or don't care and um navi being the kind of the the soft soul that she is really took a blow from that and she kind of and also the fact that she was imprisoned by the razor and she was tortured and she was uh brainwashed by the razor and Stendor didn't didn't care Stendor didn't save her nothing happened as far as her mind that you know the divines didn't didn't weren't listening to her and um 
she kind of saw that as betrayal almost like she dedicated her she wanted to dedicate her life to becoming a knight of standard she spent all she ran away from her family her friends and she um wanted to you know help people and uh do uh, dedicate everything she had to the eight and in their time of need they couldn't give a fuck i think that's um misconception that most people have about the adras um that the Adria has, is the way I interpreted the Lord, is that the Adria has given them, has given people life. Um, the, you know, the, the eight sacrificed themselves to create the world and such like, and we all know the creation story there. But yeah. then afterwards, you can't, I don't think you can really expect divine intervention unless you're, uh, unless you're Akatosh, but uh, maybe Talos, but other than that, they give you the gift. What you do with it is up to you. Well, yeah, I understand. I, I understand that. Um, it's just, you know, in her perspective, like she kind of expected this great divine intervention to happen. And, you know, um, yeah, like the eight divines, they kind of like sacrificed themselves, from, became the planets in there. Uh, they, they allowed a place for mortals to exist. And, you know, then, but, you know, uh, Anavi kind of like looked up to the sky and kind of was like, save me and expected, you know, a golden rope to appear, I guess. <laughs> and it didn't happen. Right. And I think that's the, I mean, I mean, from an IC standpoint, it's a point uh, often overlooked. I, I don't, I would figure that's something that a lot, I would figure that's something a lot of characters would understand is that, you know, the Aedra created you, but that's all you're going to get out of them. If anything, uh, they had their teachings that you can look to, but that's pretty much it. The Daedra, I, was just, I suppose, and I suppose this is why a lot of, seemingly to me anyway, a lot of folks in Tamriel con- convert to Daedra cults are, is because Daedra are, Daedra are much more just involved in the quote-unquote stirring of the pot, right? They cause chaos, they institute change, and because they have such direct or indirect involvement with mortal affairs, you'd have a lot of cultists coming up that way. At least I would think so. Oh, yeah. We got, we got, despite the fact Alana um, sees the Daedra as lesser, she does allow Daedra worship in the Razor. Uh, she won't allow anyone making their own cults in the Razor, but she does allow their own forms of worship in hopes that maybe eventually they'll learn from the error of their ways. But you constantly see that argument uh, cropping about in the Razor as the reason as to why they worship the Daedra is because they are tangible things you can actually communicate. You can actually see them do effects constantly. Horrible effects, but still effects. <laughs> And that makes me think back to something that I've read. Um, I can't remember if it was a developmentary or or book, but they referred to Tamriel as the arena. And for every player in the arena will be one of conflict. I think as soon as, I, I, I don't know, I think as soon as a character or something understands this, then, you know, they can, it's, there's sort of enlightenment on what is and what isn't in terms of, what how destiny works within the within within Tamriel. Not to say now when I say enlightenment, I don't mean Tim obviously, but just sort of understanding how the world works, that sort of thing. But yeah, everyone just uh, everyone just zero sums. Yeah, so zero sum like the. I think that's what happened to the uh, to the Dwemer is that they zero summed essentially. They it seems to match up anyway. When you zero sum, it's like you never existed. But with the Dwemer, it's just like they vanish. So. I don't know the working theory there, and I'm still working at working this tangent. But the working theory there is that because of such a large number of them, zero summed, is that it's just not possible to leave without a trace. If suddenly everyone just stop, suddenly an entire race stops existing. Does that make sense? I don't know. Well, I don't know because like uh, Talos was able to erase jungles and past and present and future, and um, sure, but that's was him, able isn't to- it? Well, yeah, it's Chim, but Zero Sum is kind of like the opposite reflection of Chim. So it would have almost the same, if the same power and capabilities of it. So uh, the Dwemer probably had something not as grand as Zero Sum, but something close, like really close. I mean, it was an offshoot. It was using the heart, which is kind of the offshoot of Lorcan. Okay, maybe I might have misunderstood Zero Sum then. Well, could you explain to me what Zero Summing is just to, just to make sure I have the right of it? From the from what I've read, and I could be wrong too. Uh, I'm just gonna put that out there. But for me, for zero sum, um, it's like it's chim. From what I've read, 
of uh, Kirk Wright's things. It's the realization of like you know, the universe and um, the whole um, the whole Godhead theory with it, and kind of realizing that everything's kind of just a dream, I guess. And uh, with zero with Chim, you kind of almost kind of a lucid dreamer in the dream. And you can control everything. And with zero sum is kind of realizing you are a dream or like an aspect of the world and you're not really real. And you kind of accept that and you kind of just disappear. But that's kind of what I kind of saw of the theories that I've read of zero sum and chim. I could, they, they could be wrong. I could be wrong. Well, I understood it as um, the sort of the reason why most individuals don't, or any individual that attempts to have Chim realize don't often make it is that as far as I understand it when you re- come to the realization that this is all that God had you have the most trying importance is to try and retain your individuality and be okay with it to to say the least but when you can't handle that truth you essentially have your existence erased at least that's how I understood it so Leave a comment in the comment section below, guys. What do you think Zero Sum is? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, yeah, Chim's kind of like the capacity to say, I am, despite the fact you're just a dream. You're a figment of a dream. You're, the, you're now a part of the dream that's gained its own consciousness and became its own being. And Zero Summing is kind of the dreamer that kind of uh, realizes there's nothing but a dream, and they kind of just, they're unable to say the words, I am. Maybe they're the dreamer and they wake up. No sage vanish from the dream. Da, da, da. That's just so sad. Just thinking like your dreams, it's these little worlds that you just destroy every time. It is it it kinda of sad, but that's uh that's Tamriel, I guess. We went off way on a tangent. Where were we? What were we talking about? Stuff and things. Um, um Let me look at my note here. Do all right. Okay, so here here's a kind of talking point. You, you mentioned to me before that uh, you did double major in psychology and uh, political philosophy. Now, obviously, Alana is a very political character. So I'm wondering what aspects of your college education have you implemented in Alana's scheming, or if you have any specific examples of that? Well, when I first, well, my first, uh, I guess, experience in a political, uh, sci- well, it, political science, political philosophy classroom was my uh, professor and his first words to us in the classroom. And I was kind of like staring at him with wide eyes after this was, uh, welcome to political science. This is the study of power, which is kind of where I kind of, when I started looking at the lore, where I kept kind of remembering that with Klopka's file and kind of attributing the two together, uh, mainly because what you know professor kind of explained to me about it and using the understanding of politics and how they work and how you know uh the battle of power between people in a political scenario really gave me a good understanding on how a political scheming character should act uh, you know being able to hold your court cards tight not let them you know, let them be uh, shown unless you know it's absolutely necessary like for example uh probably the best example of this of being able to figure out how to navigate, you know, across the political battlefield, as some call it, is um, when the Razor first began, there it was a few Tesso RP events that were actually scattered around and lost in the depths of the uh, event forum area, where um, Alana actually had the Razor outwardly as a humanitarian group um, to kind of like... Know, kind of scheme her way into society and start gaining power. She knows she had to gain power. She had to gain influence before she can start uh, making a move on anything. So she first began as this innocent humanitarian group. Humanitarian group because it's very, uh, you're more relaxed and more or less suspecting of so and people who claim themselves to be humanitarian group than, uh, you know, mercenaries or something like that. And there was a few events where she was, as a humanitarian group, she was actually gathering coin to build a uh, village, like a little town for the refugees of Cyrodiil. And, you know, they actually did build the town. They actually did gather refugees and things like that. And people could come and see the fact that the Razor actually did these kind of things and go, oh, my God, yeah, they actually are really good people. Well, 
a few, probably about a week after the billet, the town was actually made, we did an event where the razor absolutely, in the most horrific manner, destroy the village and slaughter everyone. And Alana actually uh, placed evidence in the village, uh, pinning it on the Ultimary Dominion. And the RP community I was part of um, before in the uh, in the Imperial community, I had Alana uh, actually present the fact that the village was destroyed by this old Mary Dominion and how horrible it was. So she actually went around to every single person in the community and started like, you know, riling them up against the old Mary Dominion. And the whole race's goal is to destroy the three alliances. And she wanted to pick out the old Mary Dominion because was obviously there are the ones that are the most, um, the most trouble probably out of the other ones because they're the ones that are most, they're the ones that are the easiest coexisting whole. Cause I mean, like, Fucking Dunmer and Arconian, you got Bredens and Redguards and Orcs. Like those ones be easy to pick apart and get them to fight with each other. The Minion, not so much. So she wanted to get that done and out of the way. So she actually managed to use the village and convince these entire fucking RP groups to go to war. It's the Eldmary Dominion. And it fits so well with the Razor's plan and worked out so in our favor that I got just sat back and went, I don't know what's going to happen, guys. I mean, we can't actually destroy the Dominion. But they definitely were declared enemies by these, they were by these people. Enemies. And when you add more enemies on your hit list or when you, are, when, you, when you get added to another enemy hit list, I imagine it's trouble either way. Well, yeah, and technically, the the community was uh, acting in the Razor's benefit at that point without even knowing. And they still didn't know that, you know, Alana was a cult leader or anything like that. Actually, Alana actually pretended that she was just this uh, politician that had not, that wanted the benefit of the Imperials and never, ever once showed any magical capabilities. Despite the fact she's a pretty damn good mage, she wanted to make sure that she was undermined and kind of overlooked so badly that she could easily manipulate whoever was in control in the background and this leads me to actually pose a question because i i j it just popped into my mind now so there are two facets to your guild there's the crimson ravers there itself and then there's house vajir bahir. bahir excuse me sorry um how are the two related but here is the building house of Lana and Axon. Um, so it's kind of, you almost consider it as the royalty of the Razor. Um, I noticed that trying to, using the humanitarian group at times, the Razor was fine for us to be able to RP with communities. I did want to interact with the communities and support them. It was difficult to do that with an extremely evil dark cult, though. And even with the humanitarian group, it still had its problems. So, and eventually house RP became something that was became in, uh, something of interest with the rest of the guild. We started interacting with all these other guilds with their house RP and things like that. So I said, fuck it, and decided to make the House of Heroes as an actual guild. Um, the way the two interact with each other is you can think as House Fahir as this Imperial Red Guard house that is trying to gain influence, power, and wealth, and kind of distributing it directly into the Razor. There's no paper trail between the House Fahir and the Razor. Um, Alana was very careful about that uh, so you can't it's kind of like the skeleton in the closet but alana uses the house and this any authority it gains in order to be able to expand the razor and to gain influence because alana knows that uh just going around and conquering the alliances and kicking them down and sitting your ass on a ruby throne isn't what's going to be winning anything at all it's pretty much step one complete with revolutions like these uh there's going to be the backlash like she's there's going to be people revolting is there to be like uh laws that she can't just go around just unmake all the laws into razor laws and go okay guys give up all your religions and, and you know these are razor laws you guys have to obey no no that's how you end you know your revolution very quickly um she knows that she's going to have to gain influence, she's going to have to gain power, she's going to have to gain wealth, support, she's going to have to show the people that she actually is a leader before she actually becomes the leader. <laughs> um, and with that, the house actually helps with that because she can show that she can lead and she can show that she's like, you know, for the Imperials or for the United Tamriel Front. And then it's less likely that there's going to be outcries and outrage, you know, in the time that, you know, she hopes that when she sits her happy ass on the Ruby throne. And of course, there's still going to be provinces. Like, let's just like go with like a, a scenario where the Razor wins and 
Tamriel is now has razor banners up. Um, there's going to be revolutions. Like Skyrim's going to be one. I mean, they're never going to accept anyone who's not a Nord as you know the ruler of Skyrim. Um, more one's going to be another. There's going to be prophecies that she knows that she's going to have to try gain influence in now and try to like already try to like set things up before you know even it's even complete. And that's where House, like I said, that's where House for here comes in. It's kind of like the forefront of the Razor plans. It's the thing that's gaining everything for them. Yeah, that's why. That's the way I see it. Is that House for here seems to be sort of resource acquisition, whereas Crimson Re- Razor is resource expenditure, and uh, it's all the name of con- uh, continuing the goal of you know making sure the rest of Tamriel falls into chaos. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said Alana would want to sit her happy ass on the Ruby throne. Uh, eventually, yes, despite the fact that she is very, uh, like I said, she believes that she's she's gone pretty much off the deep end with their worship of chaos and Sithis, which, I don't know, she believes that she's pretty much the chosen apotomy and Sithis at this point, and is the one chosen to pretty much bring about a new world and things like that. So getting the Ruby Throne is one step, because, uh, for that process, but most likely after, because uh, Tamriel, she's not gonna, she's not gonna be, you know, She's not be fine with just Tamriel. She wants to go to the other countries and continents and things like that and start conquering them. So most likely she'll have someone else sitting there as soon as everything there gets figured out. But other than that, um, the gaining the Ruby Throne is just a one piece of the step for her to actually have access to. I would figure that she wouldn't want it. I would figure that she would try to continue to, I mean, to continue to escalate chaos. She would try and make it so make it so that it continues to bounce around between people's hands and try to you know just make everything worse for people as it is so that pendulum swing back to peace can eventually happen at least that was my interpretation of it i wasn't expecting that the ruby throne would be on her uh list of aspirations it's not, like I said, it's like a means to the uh, actual goal. Like, she wants to take, when she wants to bring, like, the Razor is trying to spread chaos. It is trying to do all this, but it's not going to be the grand finale and that would actually set the world back into, for the pendulum to swing. Like, she wants to have it exert a, such a great amount of chaos in the world that it's not even on, it's not even recognizable afterwards. And for that, she needs to be an authority of, of, of a pretty high amount of power for that to happen, which is why her interest in the Ruby Throne is, because she needs to be in a position. It's like, her, despite the fact that she has zero interest in ruling a noble house and directing it or whatever, she knows it has to be necessary in order for the Razor's plans to be complete like she has zero interest in ability whatsoever but it kind of has to happen um for you know the grand scheme to be completed scrolling back to as far as political philosophy is concerned if we were to look at through say an aristotelian lens because you did speak about aristotle and his uh, political philosophies now they were much more realistic if you could assign aspects of it which from Aristotle to the way, uh, the way words, I have the best words. If you could assign aspects of Aristotle's political philosophy to the way Alana runs things, could you pick a, could you hand pick out any qualities there? Ah, uh, that's the thing is, I wasn't really thinking of Aristotle, I probably don't was making her a thing because it was, with, with her, uh, progression to the RP, like in her idealism and things like that, I just kind of was pretty, fast paced i couldn't really think uh of like a uh, political philosophy aspects uh to impart on her like i'm pretty certain the things i learned in college and things that definitely had a huge influence in the way that she actually views politics and things but i just can't individually pick out um anything specific i guess from it uh, what i'm trying to say is like if you looked at some of the stuff that she said that she did you could probably assign not a sign, but you could probably say, oh, like, oh, yeah, that falls in line with something that Aristotle might talk about or something of that nature, rather than go ahead and rather than saying that, you know, you had Aristotle in mind. Have I lost you there? Or does that make sense? The only thing, like, with the character, not really with her uh, capacity to be uh, 
political, but more on her own philosophies is uh, like, like a kind of probably repeated quite a bit now is uh, balance. Balance has always been something with the character light and dark and good and evil. And I mean, this is an evil villain that actually encourages people to fall in love because she knows that it's an opposite and intrinsic opposite of chaos. And we cannot have one without the other with her. Love, peace and harmony isn't something that's weakness or something to be like hated. It's actually necessary because if you love chaos and you love the things that it creates, then by uh, at the same token, you should have respect for light and love because without it, one cannot be without the other. Now with Aristotle, he had with his philosophy of virtues where you could have vices or you can have an excess of it and you have to be perfectly in the dead center of like the the, you know, the balance of it, um, I think a lot of would agree with that. And that, you know, we're all that, you know, with the whole trying to just, uh, maintain a balance within yourself and try to maintain this kind of a um, uh, capability to be able to not have excess, not have, and understand, like, you know, the difference between the vices and um, the virtues and things like that. So with uh, with Aristotle, like the courage is probably one of the easiest ones to do. Um, with Aristotle, courage is a virtue that you should probably try and obtain. But except it is, uh, you can have excess of something, and you can have um, you can have you know a vice, which is not enough of it. With uh, with the excess of it, it is you know being uh, overconfident. Uh, uh, you can be rash with it, and um, with the uh, not enough of it, you can be cowardly, timid. And with that, with Aristotle, the, the, the idea with virtues is to be in this pivotal center, to have courage. And with Alana, having the balance between the two and having the balance between within yourself is what, you know, people, mortals are trying to gain because mortals are kind of in this, they're in the center of Tamriel. They have both good and evil in them, which isn't something that's something a danger lack um and you know they're kind of to her that they were like the chosen um holders of the balance of both potomy and anu which is why they're supposed to that in a lot of size they're supposed to be greater than all other things in creation because of the fact they can obtain that central balance of virtue in them and for those wondering 12 virtues they are as follows temperance, liberality, magnificence, pride, honor, good temper, friendliness, truthfulness, wit, friendship, and justice. Now, looking at these virtues, if I were to, uh, let's say, tax them on to Alana, for my interpretation anyway, I would say that perhaps, let's say, I would say justice and good temper definitely fit her. Good temper, because as you said, she's always maintaining a uh, calm exterior in order to and, and level headedness in order to figure out how best to go about the situation and justice well because you know she, that's a very subjective term and she believes her ju she believes that justice to be all things should be in balance like thanos i can't believe i did not make that joke soon enough okay there is some times where i've watched these fucking marvel movies or these fucking hero these movies on netflix and and there's been quotes that Thanos has made, that Alana has made, despite the fact Alana is a far older character. And then there's like, oh, fuck, um, uh, X Men, Apocalypse. There, that there was a time when Apocalypse monologue, and I was looking at Axis. He was like visiting me at the time, and I was looking at things wide eyes, just going, Alana just said that in the last RP we were in. That makes me think of um, the sort of trend that most. That uh, creative villains are heading in nowadays. What I mean by that is, I saw this piece where they were talking about how the idea of what makes a villain a villain has changed its first inception. So, if we are to look at, say, some a villain from the biblical to medieval times, they've always been the, the treasure sort from Judas to Mordred to, uh, I guess, even the, the devil himself. They've always betrayed someone. Then if we're looking at a villain within the Cold War or James Bond movies during that time, well, there were always Russians or threats to democracy and institutions of communism or something of that nature. Now, when we look at villains of today, well, they seem to have a point with their philosophies and where they're going, but the means is completely crazy. 
the example I like to point out here is, I don't know if you saw the movie or not, but Black Panther. Yes. And um, with what Michael B. Jordan's character was going after, whose name I can't, whose villain name I can't remember, but I remember his real name being Dejobu or something of that nature. But, you know, he wanted Wakanda to be more involved in the world's affairs, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but that means selling Wakandan technology and having in, in creating a lot more wars and being much more interventional than what uh, T'Challa would eventually arrive to. And it's interesting to watch that trend, or it's interesting to note that trend now that it used to be, well, by our standards, it was much more black and white back in the day, but now there are definitely shades of gray with flawed executions or, you know, you don't necessarily see an evil for evil's sake sort of villain. I guess the only villain that has endured, that carries that distinction up until now is the Joker. And the Joker himself is just, for anyone that reads the DC comics nowadays after post, post DC rebirth, oof, has he gotten into some stuff. Anyway, that's a tangent for you. Well, I'm going to continue on that tangent, actually. <laughs> um, okay. Well, see, that's the kind of what I've, no- I, what I've noticed about the villains, too. Like, well, a lack of evil for evil. And like, like, even Lord of the Rings, Sauron. Sauron was more of a force. Like, it was, he was just this evil conqueror that uh, came into the story. And there there was little human, human-esque parts about him. Like, and then you look at these villains now, and they kind of, like, they they believe what they're doing is genuinely good and you know it's just they just are going about it in a really really not very good manner about it like even the razor like you know lana a lot of fully believes she'll jump up she'll jump down and just like say like she is doing what is best for the world like she's everyone should be running around thanking her for what she's trying to do but the, I, I can already admit, like, oh, it's really like, oh, like right off the bat, that what she's doing is not right, and it's not going to end the way she wants it to. And it's just, and with the whole uh, villain thing, like, I didn't want to make a character that was just, uh, you know, evil because of, you know, greed or power, or, you know, they just wanted something. Like, I have another character, a Methagel, who's just there for power. Like, that's, that's his only drive. He's fun to play because he's an arrogant prick to people, very antagonistic, but the, it's the actual storyline, his actual um, idea for, his whole reason for why he does such horrible things is kind of dry to me. Like, Alana, the reason why I absolutely adore the character is because of the fact that you have this where she's genuinely believing what she's doing is right. I mean, I think that some sort of relatability between you and your character has to be in place in order for that character to sort of, I don't know, in order to pretend that character is a living being, I guess, has to be, it has to be there is what I'm saying, that connection. And I don't think many people, unless if you're a psychopath, could probably pull off a character that's evil for evil's sake. I don't think so anyway, because no, nobody nowadays is evil for evil's sake. I mean, the only time I really kind of uh, delved into characters that were kind of like that were the Daedra. That was only because they're more of those alien uh, creatures that were typically uh, after, you know, they want to destroy mortals because they saw them as weak and, you know, they're just, the mortals were the enemies. So it was, that's kind of kind of where you could possibly see that in the Elder Scrolls universe that people are peeing it is with the Daedra, especially with the Dremora. But other than that, characters that are just purely just evil because, you know, evil i don't think there's ha- there has to be something like i said there was a born evil there has to be an underlying reason behind it that makes me think of that nature nurture debate because i do believe that some people i believe personally that some people are just born evil it just happens they cannot they cannot um relate to people as or they cannot relate or empathize with people as a normal person would, and therefore that disconnection is what ultimately leads them to harm or hurt people. And at the risk of invoking Godwin's law, because I do that all the time, I, well, I'm going to look at the Nazis for this, and I think that Hitler was definitely one such person that could not empathize with person with people in that way. And he himself, I would say, has become a historical villain. Unless if you're a neo-Nazi, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway. 
we'll have everyone along. What I want to talk now is um, about the guild that you run, the Crimson Razor, and I guess to a certain do you also run Hausva here as well, or is yeah. that take okay? I'd want to assume because uh, since that boar accents, sorry, I can't believe I forgot his name, accents. Perhaps you'd also have a hand in leading. So, but um, you're there every step of the way in leading stuff uh, and doing stuff and organizing stuff which is something I really, really relate to because I, I used to do that once upon a time. My question to you is how do you maintain the energy? It's, it's different for every person. I'm curious as to how you are able to do it because it does require a lot of energy. I mean, I work a full-time job and um, it's difficult. You know, A lot of people, they, they want to come home and they just want to relax. But for me, it kind of almost feels like I come home from my full-time job to go back to my next full-time job. And it gets exhausting. And there's times where I have to take like about a week long vacation from the guild just to kind of like uh, re-energize myself. But um, I think what's really helps is learning uh, before I try to do, try to bite off way more than I could chew. I got stressed out. I start snapping at people. I started making dumbass decisions. And now kind of realizing where my, um, how long I could push before I kind of have to like take a few steps back. Um, it, it helped. Like with the razor, I pushed extremely hard for it to make it um, self-sufficient where I could probably disappear for two weeks and the guild's going to be running normally because my officer team know what I like to see happen with the guild. All the members know what's up and, you know, what they can and cannot do and things like that. And because of the fact I already have my character already out of the story almost, so I can allow them to freely do their stories without having this, uh, having Alana come in and, you know, wreck shit up every time they fuck up something, they could do their stories off on their own and do their arcs and do everything that they want without me having to hover over them. It took quite a bit to get to this point with the guild, but now the guild is is extremely self-sufficient. I have officers who can uh, go off and recruit to do the ICV interviews and bring people in. I got people who understand the storylines and the lore. I could check up on people and they watch each other's back. And honestly, the guild itself really helps me too because we, we're we very close um, as players. Like it's... I, I, cause I in the hand, I kind of saw it too, but in the razor, it, with the ra with the razor, uh, a common kind of, I guess, saying that we like to do is that uh, with the razor, they're more than we're just more than just people that are just you know in other parts of the world. We're more than just friends of the internet. Like, the razor is pretty much a family to some people in this guild. Um, and I come online and, you know, I come to work, I'm exhausted and, you know, I just want to go lay down in bed and I turn on my Discord and I talk to them and they kind of just like make my fucking night every single time I come on. And it's, they make it easier for me to do and it kind of like gives me the perspective of why I'm doing this and it's mostly for them. Like, and I think having a player base like that, having an officer team you can trust, having people who are competent enough to be able to keep the guild going, even when you're exhausted and can't really, <laughs> and can't so much as even like uh, put throw an emote on the chat. Um, all that together has really helped, you know, being able to balance, you know, all this, all this work and uh, RL work and uh, GM work and event planning and coordination and everything like that. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of factors that can that could actually help me to not lose my sanity. But every once in a while, I do need to take a break. I do need to kind of just sit down and relax because otherwise, I'm just gonna like you know, <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> break down into a million pieces. There's been a few times where I've considered walking away from the guild. I will be honest, where I've kind of just gone so exhausted and just so just emotionally done that I was very close to just walking away. But I've never done. I've obviously I've never done it before. Um, and because it's because of them, like for my guild, for the players in them. And, you know, and uh, I want to base, make sure this guild still stands for them and that, you know, they're still happy in it. And it's because honestly, uh, they help me in so many ways and they probably don't even know it. Mm. How many people number your officer team? Um, There is currently one, two, three, four, five people, six, six, six people. I have one, uh, I have my co-GM, which is Axon. Uh, he's actually also co-GM in the house for here. I have two uh, officers and I currently have three junior officers. Uh, I mean, each of them, I kind of wanted, I know how stressful running a guild can be. So I didn't want to spread out my officers too thin. So they each kind of 
overlook different sections of the guild um, and kind of uh, watch over that. And then we kind of, in the officer meeting, we kind of just like throw all the information we have together and try to decide what's, if there's any problems or anything. And there's also like different sectors of the guild too, where individuals who aren't even officers uh, run so that they can overlook it and make sure that that RP over there is still happening. So it's kind of like um, each officer takes on a piece so they're not overwhelmed by the whole. <laughs> Okay, so when you say a piece, you'd have an officer that's dedicated to recruitment, an officer that's dedicated to events. Is that what you mean? Or yeah, um, Axon typically he kind of handles uh, everything that he kind of he does. He can do everything that I can do, but um, I prefer him just to like go off uh, do the applications, recruiting, making sure that all, some of the administration stuff is handled. And then I have another officer who's purely just you know his sole job is just to um, out of guild communications and relations with them and see. Being, you know, uh, doing uh, relationships between uh, th those outside the guild. And I have another officer who's handling making sure the stories are happening and progressing and that people have, or if there's like nothing going on, kind of just start something up or make sure events are happening on the calendar. And then the guild is actually divided into three sections. Um, like, well, they call the warrior, the mage, and the shadow. Yeah. Yeah, the path of will, path of shadow, path of strength. The warrior, the mage, and the shadow each are leaders of those. Those are the junior officers. And the guild is actually divided into those three sections. Uh, and this kind of almost adds a quality of, um, it, they, kind of they kind of like fight, they kind of just uh, race against each other to try to see which one's better. Kind of a rivalry between them, which honestly is actually needed in a cult, rivalry between, because in that kind of standpoint, you want rivalry between the cultists, so they're not looking at the leaders. <laughs> um, but um, with that, the, each path leader looks at, uh, looks after a third of the guild and you know they they kind of keep pair of them keep you know make sure that you know their storylines are happening if they have if those in their paths the questions they go to them so they are also not you know having to look after this entire whole of the guild and just got to pay attention to that piece it's only during like the officer meetings or if they approach me with a situation that everything that all the pieces of the picture kind of come together and kind of sit back and go okay this this is where problems are happening this is what i want done like, this path do that this path go over there do that how often do you have officer meetings every week it's we can't we have i try to do it every other week but the guild's too large <laughs> there's too much things that happen that i had to put it every week um in order to just to be able to handle it do you bundle this with guild meetings or is it just mainly officer meetings we tried guild-wide meetings before but um they don't really work out that well to be honest um because too big of a member base yeah there's too many voices it's like too many cooks in the kitchen it's not gonna work uh so and typically the members they've never complained before about the way we've uh, ran things or anything if they do they are can't approach anyone about it but um either or like with the officers and the junior officers and coaching him and myself we all get together in a room and we decide what's the best for the guild and then we just pass a little message to everyone else in the, in the guild what do you think has been the biggest obstacle shall we say to maintaining an evil cult guild that you think is only present to that niche because it's a very niche guild i would say as opposed to the the other house guilds that are out there, or the mercenary guilds and such like. I think the the biggest problem we have is um, teaching people how to not bleed or to understand that it's a story. With the razor, especially with the evil guild, I would almost say that bleeding is a far worse thing to do than anything else you can do in the RP, even god modding, only because of the types of themes you have in the RP. I don't want anyone bleeding with that. <laughs> um. Now, when you say bleeding, you mean obviously when people get too invested and start to feel, um, shall we say, OOC annoyance? Is that the polite term for it? Oh, well, they don't get pissed off if someone smacks their character. Yeah, and also when you know you have these, you have these topics, and you have these types of RPs that goes completely against people's morales. And you know, we have had people that kind of like, kind of kind of you know kind of had a bit of trouble uh seeing those kind of things like seeing the torture and you know the things these characters did and you know not trying to like accuse the player of being so such a terrible person because of it and we're kind of just raising our hands going this is what our character does <laughs> i mean there's been things that my, any of my characters have done that i've like absolutely just cringed internally at and you know i kind of like had and not, not many people in the razor do have 
had done this recently, uh, but earlier in the beginning, very beginning of the guild, there was a few people who just couldn't handle it, and they honestly just kind of started getting very antagonistic. Oh, Seely. Uh, towards other members of the guild for what their character was doing. And that's something that can happen uh, and kind of just try to make sure that everyone realizes that uh, j my character is not me. It's not that just because that the character has that opinion doesn't mean I have that opinion. And like in the very beginning of the guild, um, when we did first did the RP, I really wanted to set the bar for kind of the... Uh, the layout for how dark the guild was going to go. And the um, guild's IC location is actually below the Pelon Graveyard uh, near Evermore. And there's like the chapel there. And a lot of wanted to blasphemize the chapel because, you know, ambiance. Um, <laughs> and also because I thought it was a really, really fun RP to do. Now, there is a level of human sacrifice that went into that RP and the ritual involved, blasphemizing the area in the graveyard and to ensure that the uh, uh, that the Razor's base was secured. And there was quite a few people that had a problem with it. Like they were very upset with the fact that you know they, they we were writing stories about you know human sacrifice and things like that for ritualistic purposes. And eventually, I worked with them. And probably about two months later, we did an RP where uh, we got to slaughter like a village, a small village or whatever. And I told them that you know what, I'm gonna let you guys have at it. You guys can DM the villagers, or you can DM whatever your character does. Like you, whatever you guys is try attempt to do is success. Have fun with it. And this guild, <laughs> a few months prior, was having a horrible time with um, you know human sacrifice. It was very upset with uh, seeing that kind of story being written. Now was emoting having like uh, having their characters tear like tear entire fa destroying entire family homes, killing children, and you know just butchering people as best as they fucking could in the de in the emotes. So with that, I mean we've had people, especially with uh, heavy torture scenes, uh, mm -hmm. get very uncomfortable. With it and that's understandable they can walk away anytime nothing in the razor they're forced to uh, engage in and honestly with the very very heavy torture stuff we always put a warning basically on it like the torture session that's gonna be happening uh, tonight with my character is gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be probably the worst one we've had um in a very long time which is why there's gonna be a lot of uh warnings about it uh, earlier on um because we've had people that have kind of gotten very upset at other players for what their character has done. And like, and like I said, because of the fact that this guild is so focused on uh, communication and, you know, players, you know, uh, being friends with each other and like connection between players, it's devastating when you have a player that kind of runs around and starts getting angry at someone over what their character did. Okay, okay. And how do you remedy that just a little bit? I mean, um, if someone does start to get, say, a bit too invested in what's going on, do you take them aside and say, hey, man, you're, uh, you're going a little too heavy. Back up just a little bit. Breathe, breathe. You know, it's all good. If I well, see someone getting uh, too emotional, either bleeding from... Um... So it's like to me, there's two ways you could bleed. You could either bleed where you, the, the player, starts acting up, and they start actually uh, their attitude starts changing, and uh, because of what's happened with the RP, or the character actually starts changing. We've had seen that happen many times before, where all of a sudden um, a player might have said something that another player doesn't like, and all of a sudden their character is attacking that character, and it's just uh, for no reason. Uh, typically, when this those type of scenarios start happening, um, I best solution honestly is just to pull them to the side and just tell them that right now they can't rp because they're unable to either rp their character or they're just too wound up right now to be able to actually focus on the rp and they usually take a bit of a step back from that mm. that second bit confuses me just a little bit though um if a if a person says if a character says something that the other character likes doesn't like and the character suddenly starts to change but it's like we've had I mean, like it's we've had a so like, we've had a scenario where, for example, where um, there is a player who um, s didn't like what uh, another player uh, did in the um, in the in a DM, um, and for no reason whatsoever, that character, despite the fact I had no knowledge what that character did 
in the RP um, started getting very snarly and growly at the other character for no fucking reason whatsoever. Um, and so but, you mean to say it was like when there's an inconsistency between how the character yeah it's kind of like it's kind of like for example say like a character's at a party and they're usually like a super party goer happy chipper go lucky person but the player is in a state of depression and they're not they're kind of moody and they don't know and the character starts acting like that that's yeah it's that's kind of like where i could see like where there's two different types of bleeds like the player's emotions can actually uh influence the character's actions just as much as what's happening in the rp can influence the player's emotions towards it okay let's change up the track a little bit you've done um, a few server or a few events for the community and it's obvious that you do care about the community a little bit that you want to bring stuff to them one of them being the crap what was the name i lost the name the Fiery Night event. There we go. Yes, I remember that now. Now, the reason I bring this up first is because I actually attended one of these in character uh, with a friend of mine. I believe uh, there was some sort of contest at the time. I'm sorry, I can't really remember where it was. but Or sorry, I do remember it was at an island. Oh, Seely. Yeah, it was the uh, island that was next to Tapa's Blessing. It was like the... the yes. Yeah. Personally speaking, my character brought along his friend uh, who was a red guard, but not necessarily born in the desert. So he wanted to give her the chance to sort of connect with her culture and so on and so forth. And it was it was a pleasant event. I remember it was a, there was a storytelling aspect of, of it, wasn't there? I think there was. Anyway, so my question to you is um, why that event? What, what, what were you hoping to accomplish by right now? Now, that was a House of Here event. And with, with that, um, I really want to make the uh, the, the icy aspects between the Razor and the House of Here a lot more, not just like the House of Here just being this. Like, you, you guys have to take it by word that House of Here is good. It doesn't do anything evil. Like, I know I actually want to do the events that actually say, no, yeah, the, no, it's, this House of Here is the good, noble, Red Guard, Imperial House. So the House actually does go out and do humanitarian things. It actually does go out and do Red Guard celebration events and things like that to really hone in on the diversity between the Razor and uh, House for Here. Uh, I also want to make sure House for Here also like does another aspect too with it, and that allows um, those in the Razor to not always constantly have to play equal characters. I mean, we come to the guild because we adore the, you know playing the villain and the dark characters, but it gets exhausting doing that like every time we come online. House for Here gives us the option to be able to do these type of events and do these types of RPs that have nothing to do with the Razor and is literally just to cement uh, House for Here's, uh, you know, place as being this Imperial Red Guard political house. So Fiery Night was legit just for that. It was just for the house to kind of just go, yeah, guys, Red Guard house. Let's celebrate a Red, Dark, Red Guard holiday like the Red Guards we are. Nothing evil here. Okay, okay. Now, uh, I totally... I get what you're saying there. Um, now, is it, you don't host this event anymore, do you? Well, the Red Guard holiday is Fiery Night is an annual holiday for the Red Guards. So I'm, I mean, if, the, if enough people enjoyed it, that I probably will do the next year ones uh, for that. I think it's in June. Is it in June? I believe Absolutely. that's when it was. Um, May, June. I think it was around. Uh, maybe May or so. The reason I recall it is because I was also in Vienna at the time and I was up really late at night, but that's besides the point. Um, okay. The second one is Meteor Night's Dream. Non evil event. Talk to me about it. Eastmark, of all places, which I thought was funny. Yeah, uh, well, actually, the Ice Lily was actually in Cyrodiil. The Razor actually has great interest in the Cyrodiil region, um, especially with its criminal activities. But that was actually for the uh, concourse community that the uh, house had joined, because uh, we tried to support as many communities as we could. So we decided I had the house uh, join the concourse. And we were kind of doing the get-together for that. And um, again, uh, the concourse is like, the for anyone's information, the concourse is a... Uh, community hub for uh, nob nobility guilds to come together. And so there's like a lot of political power coming up uh, in that. And Alana wanted to make sure that, you know, she uh, jumped on board to be hosting the next concourse gathering because that would be a major power boost for the uh, house and in turn the Razor if they were the ones that got all these uh, 
you know, uh, power noble figures together and host a party for them to enjoy. So again, that was another one where the um, Razor and he was using the House to try to gain as much political favor as possible um, and try to gain as much influence as possible and kind of use the opportunity to try to strike deals with whichever noble uh, was attending. Okay, then, so moving on from that, let's move on to Club Ode, because I think this is, um, with respect to your the other events that um, you guys have hosted, I think this is probably the most unique one. As you pointed out to me, it's that it is a club that obviously has sexual undertones, which is not done at least not to my knowledge and from the sound of from the looks of it not that anybody else does um in the community um it's obviously to me it sounds like i haven't been there before myself but to me it sounds like a venue where illicit activities would happen maybe skooma selling or black market sort of stuff um now with this and this is just a question out of curiosity uh, with the sexual undertones that it has, how do you avoid falling into a falling into a pit with it? Because regardless of whether you, what your stance is on ERP, you you can get some very troublesome individuals, shall we say, hopping over to these events and looking for some poon. Does that make sense? Yeah, we kind of fully expected that something like that would happen, which is why we actually have uh, two venues for the club boat. We have the actual club, and we also have the pleasure cruise, which is where, you know, it's literally a ship with everything you could possibly have to erp with. It's by choice that players and characters could go, and I don't judge it. It's a it's just a form of RP, whatever. That If that's your story, then okay. But um, with the club, no ERP is to happen on the, on the grounds of the club, because mm. they, we have this other venue they could do it kind of separates it and yeah we have um there's there's dancers of course and yes they can have um posts or not but we have employee forms that they have to fill out and they have it actually does say on there that they have to have a uh, tasteful posts nothing raunchy nothing you know just ex- just something that's actually um like I said, it's tasteful for the club. It adds uh, the ambiance to the club. It's not meant to be this herbaholic center because it's not, because the yes, it's, it's supposed to be this illicit club. So of course, sexual undertones are expected with it. But the it's not supposed to be in your face unless you actually seek it out. Um, there's other portions of the club is, yes, there's drugs and there is um, illicit goods being sold and trafficked through there. Now, there's, there's, even, there's even human trafficking for vampires that happen in the club. But there's also necromancy. There's uh, monster characters can actually find a home there. It's pretty much um, a avenue for every single dark RP you can imagine be able to coexist in this one community areas. Um, hell, even above the bar, there is actually an entire wall where you actually had a bunch of those wanted posters. In Icely, if your character brings a wanted poster of themselves to the bar, it puts it up, they'll get half off their drinks for the rest of the time in Club Oat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we do, we do things like that. Um, it was it was risky because I was really uncertain in the reaction to the sexual dark nature of the club. Um, which is why there's like a bunch of warnings, it's 18 plus. And you know, there's, it's, it's more of like a drugs, crime, sex, debauchery. It's everything club out provides and monsters can, tra- can turn. Uh, there's actually a rule of the club that if werewolves turn and they leave fur around, they have to stay after hours to sweep it up. Um, vampires, they can find blood at the bar. It's a place for dark characters to relax, be able to reveal themselves and kind of be able to communicate with each other without fear of, you know, anyone at all. And I wanted to do a club and I, this one was actually influenced by, by uh, have you watched the TV show Lucifer? Yeah, yeah, it's the the English dude playing Satan who comes down to Earth. I, I've heard of it, but never really got my fancy. There's a club that he runs called Lux, and it, Club Oat was very echoing of that, where it is this illegal club where you know it's a party full on debauchery, drinking, dancing, just having a blast. With a, also very there's also dark, very dark undertones with it, and it's something that I've never actually seen happen in Tesso RP before, and especially not with a club vibe with it. And we really, really wanted to make something unique for people to enjoy. And honestly, with the uh, 
with the uh, sexual undertones that happen with it, it does give it a different vibe and a different feeling towards that other places wouldn't necessarily have. And we do maintain uh, quite a bit of control over it and making sure that everyone's mature with it and acting inappropriately with it like there's rules that you can't you can't be erping under a table or whatever or just going out to the dance floor and fucking someone like you can't do that like you still have to maintain the the same rules that are there but there's always just this underlying like feeling in the club with it to me it sounds like you've had next to no incidents though no we haven't had a single incident yet and i would attribute that to the maturity of the usorp certainly while, while I do have many gripes about it, it is certainly, for one thing I could say, that it is certainly is mature than much more of the other RP communities that I've, RP communities that I've delved in. Not as fantastical as, you know, Guild Wars 2, and it's definitely leaps and bounds ahead of, you know, the EU SOTOR RP community. Um, so for them to abide by, you know, what you guys are going for, to me, is not surprising, but definitely welcomed, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, you know, it, I mean, it also helps it's a player home, and they know they can get their asses oh, yeah. booted, so... But, um, no, I would say that there, I haven't, didn't get as much as a backlash as I thought I would with the club. Like, usually people who kind of, like, turn their noses at it and go, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, you, they're killed, nothing more than an herbaholic. They don't, they kind of just keep silent and don't just don't join in on the RP. Yeah, there is that stigma there that seems to come in with uh, the sort of sexuality and RP and all. I, I don't. It's it's interesting to watch, not watch, but it's interesting to observe how they get totally Victorian at times when it comes to you know the sec the sexuality of it. They'll say that you know they some folks will say that you know they don't they don't mind it so long as you keep it private and out of their face but at the same time that won't stop them from like gossiping like pigeons over when it happens or something of that nature it's it's really weird well yeah it's just like when you present even like even uh sexual undertones and don't actually have the full blown herb you can also almost be you can still be accused of doing that like for instance like going back to v um she like i said she's a very she's a very seductive character she portrays herself as very sexual and very lustful and yet no one that there's only one other person in the guild that she's actually like actually erped with and she actually married him so <laughs> you can you can wonder how much how like uh how i guess um I guess sluttish she is because of it. Um, like the fact that she, you know, she's, she's the first, the one person that she's like, uh, that she actually has, uh, fucked around with. She's actually currently currently marrying, and yet I would co still constantly get accusations of the character being like, you know, the slut whore and all that other things. And I'm like looking, I'm going, is she portrays her portrays herself as sexual, but doesn't mean she actually does it. <laughs> mm. That's the thing with Club Oat. Like, you, you have you put a sexual sexualized undertones, and yes, we have the pleasure groups, so they actually can do that. But even with just Club Oat stand alone, um, we, you can get accused of almost like just wanting nothing but erp and just running around and having your characters erp everything left and right like fucking rabbits. And we're kind of just like raising our hands and going, "No, actually, that's just the theme." <laughs> Yeah, overall, though, you seem to be doing well with it. I hope you guys, just, you know, continue to be doing well with it. Because as you said, it is unique, and those types of CD underbelly settings are, they're not present. They're not prominent. No, they should, not saying that they should be prominent, but they are definitely something of a lost opportunity that I feel most folks may not take advantage of if they knew what they could be getting into. Does that make sense? Oh, it can be a lot of fun, especially for characters that constantly have to hide the fact that they're monsters, or characters have to hide their little sadistic natures, or you know, they're necromancers and things like that. So, like just the other day, uh, we had a special event that happened where there was like a bunch of. Um, it was uh, pretty. The it was like a uh, dress up as a Daedric kind of thing. It was like an echo of Zoss's um, Daedric Prince dress up, except it was like all 
Daedra they could do. And, you know, we had, like, a special summoning circle for people to summon Daedra. And, you know, all drinks with a Daedric name were on sale. And, you know, the, the store in Club Oat was selling all the Daedric items. And, actually, the next special event we're actually going to be doing with that, too, uh, bring presents a very unique opportunity for the club to have that all the places can actually do. And it's actually going to be a necromancy theme. And I, the name of the theme is Build a Dead. <laughs> because because we're literally going to be... Build a Dead thinking, Workshop. We're literally making a Build a Dead <laughs> Workshop with it. And there's actually going to be a competition who could build the best and most unique and most... Uh, most uh, in, best construct, undead construct. And there's going to be black soul gems on sale. You can like pick out a uh, soul. If you, there's going to be like a lineup of black soul gems for people to choose if they want to put an alt or soul in their construct or a bread and soul in their construct. Uh, the, the necromancy tombs are going to be available. There's going to be fully built undead for necromancers to take home. And this is like something that not a lot of other places have the ability to kind of do. It's going to be, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. We have quite a few necromancers right now in the kills. So they're going to be, and with the upcoming uh, new necromancy update, I'm pretty sure that, you know, there's quite a few people that could be excited over that one. Okay. So we are now nearing our end. We are almost there. But as with all episodes, I tend to close it out with a 10 item questionnaire where we get to poke around that brain of yours in a unique way with. 10 unique questions. These questions were first created by Marcel Proust, then put on display by uh, Bernard Pivot in his program, Bouillon de Culture. Probably butchered that a little bit. And then finally made mainstream in James Lipton's Inside the Actor's Studio. So 10 questions, and then you're free. Are you ready? Okay. Yes. Okay. Number one, what is your favorite word? Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm gonna have to think of that one for a sec. Um, you know what? Let's just go with crimson because I like the the word, and that's kind of why I named my race. Put razor, slap the razor at the end of it for that. Number two. What is your least favorite word? Puce. What do you I mean hate it. Puce. It sounds weird. <laughs> Well, what did the color ever do to you, though? You it looks be... weird. It sounds weird. It, it forms weird when you say it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You pucist. <laughs> no! <laughs> and here I thought we were living in a day where we could finally see beyond color. You pucist. <laughs> I, I see, I'm sorry, I see shades of things that aren't puce. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, seriousness. <clears throat> Number three, what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Well, with, with the creativity part, I guess, I mean, looking at my RP and, you know, the themes I tend to go for, uh, I tend to get more intrigued with things that have, like, conflicts of morality in them, um, you know, and it kind of, like, really uh, challenges you in those aspects. Anything else? If that makes sense. Yeah, conflicts of morality, anything else? Um, things that, uh, anything that's, like, really emotionally driven, like, even with stories, too, like, if they're really emotionally driven, I find more, far more interest with them and can actually, like, follow a lot, a lot more better than ones that are kind of just not, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, an intensely emotional, intentional, not intensely, but an emotional story-driven conflict of morality. Yes, there we go. Number four. Opposite of this question, what turns you off? Predictability. I, I, I can't. It's just like, immediately I just kind of just, kind of just start drowsing off and not paying attention. Number five. What is your favorite curse word? Probably fuck. I've used it a lot. Number six. What sound or noise do you love? I like the sound of rain. I do. And the wind uh, from inside, looking out. The sound of rain from inside a building when you're in a nice warm. That's always nice to hear. What sound or noise do you hate? Uh, I hate it when you have the sound of, uh, and this actually happens to, uh, happened to me at work, and it scared the shit out of me. I hated it. Um, when, like, you know, I got, like, a bunch of water, like, hits, like, uh, d the deep fryer. It, like, makes a huge sizzling sound. I fucking hate that.
What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, it's either be an author or going to politics, either or. What profession would you not like to do? Ever in a million years, they could not pay you enough to do it. Anything? Okay. Like, I know I'm female and all, and r are females, but anything to do with the makeup industry, I would fucking hate. And finally, for our last question. If heaven exists, if it does, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Um... You, you did all right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sabriel, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Ladies and gentlemen, this marks the end of this episode. It's good to be back. I hope to deliver on another episode very soon. Bye-bye. See ya. Like what you listen to? Well, here's an obligatory promotion designed to make sure you tune in for more. Click that subscribe button, hit the like button, and leave a comment if you're feeling generous. If you'd like these episodes on the go, you can also download them directly from rphq.org. RPHQ offers role players a wide variety of resources to draw from to enhance their own role playing experience. Want to role play a blacksmith, but you have no dang clue how dang blacksmithing works? RPHQ. Trying to figure out how to make your players fear you in your tabletop game? RPHQ. Need some online links to dice rollers? RPHQ. Stop on by and see what you can learn by perusing the site. Thanks so much, folks. Stay frosty.